and a very warm welcome to our fourth Ocean Decade Laboratory, a healthy and resilient ocean, hosted by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research in partnership with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. My name is Monica Jones. I'm very happy to be back to guide you through the program. And I hope you're well and fine and healthy and happy despite these trying times we live in with the still ongoing pandemic and of course we now also live with the greatest threat to global peace since the end of the cold war who would have thought but i'm so grateful and all the organizers are so grateful that despite those trying times you still have the capacity to focus on another very very crucial uh, problem and challenge for humanity and our planet, namely to keep the ocean healthy and resilient. Sadly, the world's largest economy is not in good shape. The ocean health is in decline, and that is the United Assembly of 2030. The United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development the ocean decade. The aim is to bring together scientists and to help restore the planet's largest ecosystem, prepare the path uh, the previous uh, laboratories, let me speak, because the first International Ocean Decade Conference was kicked off and it's been followed by seven ocean decades. I'm not quite sure if you could hear all the beginning of what I've said, but I'll keep it very short. First of all, a very warm welcome to our fourth Ocean Decade Laboratory, focusing on a healthy and resilient ocean. And this is an event that is hosted by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research in partnership with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. It's great to have you with us because, as we all know, uh, the ocean's health is in decline. It is the planet's largest ecosystem and this is why the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed 2021 to 2030 as the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, hence in short the Ocean Decade. And that was kicked off last year with a high-level event and now there are seven Ocean Decade laboratories uh, following suit, three of which already took place last year, an engaging, inspiring ocean, a predicted ocean and a clean ocean. Ocean, and today we focus on a healthy and resilient ocean. Okay, that in a nutshell is what I said previously, uh, because this is a digital conference uh, and we want you to still engage with us. We have a fantastic online interactive platform. And let's just briefly take a quick look at what it does. Now, first of all, you need to be in the live stream, and I take it you are, else you wouldn't see and hear me. Um, you can choose the language in which you want to follow our event. That's uh, English, French or Spanish, or else English with subtitles. Now, you see on the right-hand side a big white space. That is the chat. So here you can engage in our panel discussion by submitting your comments and your questions. And when you scroll below the live stream, you get an overview of our agenda information about all the sessions that take place today, tomorrow, like the satellite activities and Friday's wrap-up. And further down, you get even more information, including the speaker's biographies. Now, there's also a live help desk available today and on Friday, where you can get in touch with our team 
if, in case you run into any technical difficulties. On the left-hand side, the column, lots of functions there, like the lounge. Here you can review all the laboratories that already took place. Below, you find the satellite activities. There are 29 in total taking place today, tomorrow, and on Friday, all over the globe in different time zones. Now, we've already reached the Ocean Library, where you find tons of materials, photos, documents that you can download, as well as the frequently asked question section and the Ocean Decade booth, of course. Very interesting, a kind of digital trade fair focusing on three specific satellite activity projects. So there's plenty for you to uh, explore. And you can still see all the possibilities that you have there in our Ocean Decade booth. But you, you can play around with it. We do have some breaks. Uh, what is important for you to know are the three arrows, the three arrow symbol down, which uh, takes you to the interactive networking tables. And that is definitely something that should be very interesting for you at the end of this core event. Now, if you use Twitter, then we'd appreciate it if you used the hashtag Ocean Decade when sharing content online. And if you're watching us on YouTube, which is also possible, then you can only watch and listen. You cannot engage, but you can change that because you can still register uh, going to the website Ocean Decade hyphen conference.com. A quick look at what you can expect today over the next uh, four hours. Uh, we will look at ocean health around the world, explore common themes as well as regional differences in order to better understand how we can improve the ocean's health. We'll hear different voices from different walks of life. Uh, we will have uh, kids, school kids here. We will have an artist here, lots of scientists, of course. We'll hear from various initiatives, groups around the world who already foster coastal and oceanic uh, regions. Uh, to find out what is being done and what still needs to be done. And each of these segments will uh, also include a discussion round. So we will have a traditional panel discussion, if you like, but we'll also open it up and include your questions, the ones that you can submit in the chat. And at the end of this core event, as I mentioned, you can also join the networking tables and, of course, the satellite activities, but we're not there yet. Let's stick to this core event, first of all, and let's get this fourth ocean decade laboratory officially underway with a welcome from our hosts. And we're starting with uh, Oda Kepler. She is Deputy Director General, Sustainability Provision for the Future of the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, a very warm welcome, Ms. Kepler, and we look forward to your words. Over to you. Thank you, Monica Jones. Dear ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for the opportunity to welcome you in the name of the German Federal Ministry for Education and Research, the so-called BMBF, to this important event. Of course, uh, it was just mentioned by Monica, sadly, Putin's war in Ukraine is casting a shadow also on today's laboratory. And be sure our thoughts and solidarity are with the people in Ukraine and their families. A healthy and resilient ocean. With a laboratory on this topic, we are initiating the second year of the United Nations Ocean Decade. The Ocean Decade is an important element in paving the way to a sustainable future. Imagine the ocean were a patient. What would its doctor say? There is no straightforward answer to this question. What we do know is that the ocean is far from being the seemingly endless resource we imagine it to be and we would like it to be. In many places, it is reaching the limits of its capacity. We very much need the ocean, though, as a source of food and energy, as a habitat and trade route, as an economic factor, and as a fascinating place of longing, as a climate machine in the global climate system, and as a carbon and heat sink in times of increasing climate change. A little less than two weeks ago, the IPCC published its current assessment report. The report highlights the far-reaching impact of climate change on our societies and ecosystems. In some cases, such as coral reefs, systems have already exceeded the adaptive capacity. 
Today's laboratory will focus on important questions such as what exactly is the current situation of the ocean? What exactly constitutes a healthy ocean? What knowledge and capacities do we need to ensure a healthy and resilient ocean worldwide? These issues are now more urgent than ever before. They lay the foundation for the management of marine ecosystems. Only with the right knowledge we can make sustainable use of our seas and oceans and at the same time protect them in the long term. Science plays a vital role when it comes to answering these questions. The coalition agreement of the new German federal government asserts Germany's position as a competent and reliable partner for marine research in the context of the United Nations ocean decade. And this includes our research on the role of the ocean in climate change, its ability to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, on marine diversity and marine protection conventions, on marine pollution and the deep sea, including the impact of potential deep sea mining activities. It also includes our excellent research institutions, their high-tech infrastructure and our research vessel fleet. Germany wants to bring all these things to the ocean decade. It is therefore my great pleasure to launch this Ocean Decade Laboratory on a healthy and resilient ocean in partnership with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. The idea of this partnership for the second year of the UN Ocean Decade is to enhance multinational links in ocean science. It also contributes towards the objectives of the Ocean Decade. A healthy and resilient ocean requires new findings and solutions, as well as new contacts and partnerships. In a nutshell, it requires international ocean science with and for the ocean, with, with and for societies. And I now wish all the researchers, scientists, pupils, decision makers and practitioners who are contributing to this event and those who are watching an inspiring fourth ocean decade laboratory. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Oda Kepler, for these words. And we will definitely try uh, to engage and uh, to come up with great ideas and solutions uh, for a healthy and resilient oceans over the next four hours. I would also like uh, to share something with all of you. Uh, it is a quote, the planet cannot be healthy without a healthy ocean. And this is what we call an engagement post uh, from Ambassador Peter Thompson, UNSG Special Envoy for the Ocean, which can be found on the BMBF and the IOC UNESCO Twitter account. And the link of that can be found in the chat uh, on the conference platform. Why? Because we would like you to also add your thoughts, your engagement posts. And I'm very sure that uh, the organizers look forward to your input. And that, of course, also includes uh, the IOC of UNESCO, which, as I mentioned earlier, acts as the co-host of the entire Ocean Decade Laboratories. We're very happy now to welcome the IOC's Executive Secretary, Vladimir Ryabinin. Uh, Vladimir, over to you. So, dear participants in the Healthy and Resilient Ocean Laboratory, thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you, Monica for, uh, I'm pretty sure it will be as uh, amazing as uh, the previous laboratories, your leadership uh, and your wonderful uh, way of uh, bringing everyone together. I would like to thank on behalf of the Environmental Oceanographic Commission, that is the coordinator of the decade, the expert group that is putting together the program of, of the laboratory. So, a healthy and resilient ocean. This is actually one of the uh, ultimate targets of the decade of ocean science for sustainable development, because it will uh, embrace all the achievements that we need to, to make. Because healthy, resilient ocean is uh, is only possible when we know the composition and the functioning of ecosystems, and we don't. When we know the number of species that exist in the ocean, how they interact, and we actually don't. We, how the multiple stressors work on the ocean. So that is also a new thing. So this is, I think, a revolutionary laboratory that we need to uh, conduct and bring together the, the, the enthusiasts 
professional enthusiasts working in this critical part of the decade. I would like also to say that recognizing that uh, the knowledge of the ocean ecosystems is insufficient. The IOC UNESCO conducted, the, uh, well, announced the second call for decade actions, and uh, it just finished. It started in 2021, finished in, uh, the, uh, on the last, last day of January 2022. And we have around 20 submissions for the de programs that we're focusing on the health of ocean ecosystems. So uh, together with the existence of the ocean biodiversity information system, with the observing system that are focusing on, on the biological, ecological state of the ocean, I think we have now solid foundation for moving forward. You know, the ocean decade is decade uh, of co-design. So we all come together, the best brains, uh, all, uh, and we design uh, the science that we need, uh, also focusing on the health of ecosystems. So with that, I would strongly recommend to you to please register for the Decade Forum. And please also offer your services for the roster of experts of the Decade, because I think it's only that if we work together, we will be able to understand how to move towards healthy resilient ocean on the basis of something that is emerging that is sustainable ocean planning that is based on also on science so this is the paradigm we are developing in the decade and i hope very much that the laboratory uh, over the three days moving around the world we move forward our understanding of how we can move to the healthy and resilient ocean thank you so much for doing what you're doing Thank you so much, uh, Vladimir Ryabinin, Executive Secretary of IOC. And I would like to pick up uh, this uh, call for action in terms of joining the expert roster straight away. And I will keep reminding all of you, uh, the Decade Coordination and IOC UNESCO Secretariat does need your support with strategic, technical and review processes. So interested individuals who like to participate in the expert roster, they are kindly asked to join the Global Stakeholder Forum of the Ocean Decade and access the online form in the Take Action section, and we also have a link to all that in our chat. So keep checking that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we still have two, <laughs> one lady and one gentleman here in the studio, and uh, they are none others than the co-chairs of this particular laboratory, namely Tim Yenayan. He is uh, the head of the work group Ecological Bio Biogeochemistry at the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research in Bremen, and Karen Wiltshire, our Vice Director at the Alfred Wigner Institute, Director Biological Station on Helgoland Island. Both of them in the studio with me now, Tim, Karen. Uh, I look forward to the next uh, four hours and I wonder what can we expect? Oh, well, I'm telling you, I'm really excited about this after all our preparation and particularly excited about hearing what everyone else has to say out there, um, all works of walks of life about how they see a future healthy and resilient ocean. And maybe we'll come up with a few positive ideas at the end. Who knows? I'm sure we will. Yeah, I also hope so too. I think it's uh, it's exciting that we have so many people with us. Um, health is a very big term and uh, it would be interesting to see and to realize today what it means to people and there are probably different opinions. We have people from the high latitudes to the low latitudes, scientists to artists to pupils and I'm really thrilled to do this exciting event and I'm happy to co-chair this with Karen, and we're looking forward to a fantastic core event. Absolutely. And all the input that we get from all the speakers, uh, but also from you who are, as I mentioned, also invited to join by using the chat, for example. So the first session is entitled Ocean Health Around the World, uh, because multiple human stresses in the form of unsustainable activities in coastal, coastal areas see are part of a complex interaction with climate change, and we need to better understand the the impact our interaction with the ocean has um, so that we can create the necessary tools for marine ecosystem frameworks to build resilience, monitor thresholds, avoid ecological tipping points. And uh, we need to ensure that the ocean ecosystem functions are sustainable for the benefit of, the so of society and the planet as a whole. And there are a lot of people around the world who have their own thoughts about that, which they voice for us. Let's listen in.
the ocean health is closely related to human health. So for that reason, we need to pay more attention to the multiple stressors that we humans are imposing on the ocean. Things like ocean warming, ocean acidification, overfishing or pollution. Not only for the ocean's sake, but for our own. Only a diverse ocean can be a healthy ocean, because biodiversity is the insurance the oceans need to cope with environmental change, human-made or natural. So the study and discovery of the unknown marine biodiversity is key to ocean stewardship. To ensure that our oceans continue to provide benefits to current and future generations, it is urgent to increase efforts to restore our ocean health. For the health of our oceans, we are a healthy ocean would be synonymous with a clean or rather sustainable habitat that would continue to support all life without getting perished itself. To me, a healthy ocean is one that we don't treat as a dump, into which we mindlessly give all of our excess nutrients, our gases and our toxic wastes. We need to become aware of what the ocean does for us and meet it with their appropriate respect. The ocean is a home for billions of species. The ocean is that provide us with many ecosystem services, including biodiversity, killing water, tourism, carbon storage, and seafood. that people are concerned about ocean health. It's an embarrassing truth that we are more co concerned in uh, exploiting the uh, ocean resource than uh, preserving them. My vision of a healthy ocean is that the ocean free from pollution. The water is clean and clear. I think the ocean is very resilient, but we have taken it for granted for too long. If we don't change our behavior now, we will experience tipping point events that may change life on Earth as we know it. I think the ocean where I live is healthy because we can still feel our spirit. The spirit of our first mother, the Earth. Water is life for all things. Without the spirit of water, we have nothing. Not only do we need her, but she needs all of us. So we established that uh, the health of the ocean is in decline, but there is some good news too. We're not starting from scratch. Scientific experts around the world have already gathered valuable data about the ocean's health in their respected regions. And we are now about uh, to, uh, to find out uh, about their findings, their solutions. We will have four impulse lectures followed by a discussion round with you. And our first expert is Professor Anya Wait, she's Associate Vice President Research of Dalhousie University and Scientific Director and CEO of the Ocean Frontier Institute. Uh, she also co-chairs the prestigious Global Ocean Observation System Steering Committee, and if I may add, the first woman at the head of this body since uh, its creation, and that was in 2011. She also sits on the board of Canada's Ocean Supercluster and the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network and she is now joining us here for the Ocean Decade Laboratory. Uh, Professor Waite, so very good to have you with us. Uh, we're all ears. Thanks so much. It's great to be here and what a great um, discussion today. Um, could I have the first slide, please? So I've reflected quite a lot on what is actually meant by a healthy and resilient ocean. And to me, a healthy and resilient ocean is productive. It's also diverse. But in my role as co-chair of the Global Observing System, I also think that the ocean must be well observed to stay healthy. And so that's something that matters a lot to me. So I'm based right now in Canada, 
Next, uh, one click, please. We have a very strong and uh, energetic ocean, the Atlantic. Um, so just next slide, please. I think there's just a picture. Yep. So you can see here, if you look at this breaking wave, you can see that in front of it, there's this beautiful ecosystem underneath the ocean, which is barely visible from outside. It's actually an amazing kelp forest. Next slide, please. And that underneath is, is biodiverse and very, very productive. The problem here is if we don't actually observe it well, we don't know what's going on. So it's critical that we get underneath the waves, that we actually see what's happening in the ocean. And that's not easy because the ocean is actually, we live on land, we're not marine animals. So we actually need to send probes and sensors. We need to measure and observe what's going on in the ocean with cameras and other um, types of technologies. And this is one of the big changes in, in uh, recent decades is that we can get under the ocean better with imaging and sensors and other technologies that tell us the story of what's happening in the ocean. So next slide, please. So the question then is, what is a healthy, resilient ocean that looks well observed? And one of the things that we often miss about the ocean is that it is absolutely critical in getting us to our climate goals. For example, the 1.5 degree limiting ourselves on the earth to 1.5 degree warming. And the climate targets, in order to have effective climate targets, we need to have an effectively observed ocean. Policies for getting ourselves to our climate targets often fail to recognize the fact that the ocean has actually absorbed 40% of the fossil fuels that we have emitted, and the other 60% has ended up in the atmosphere. Next slide, please. So what you can see here is that our emissions on the left in the brown and the absorption on the right, you can see what hasn't gone into the atmosphere has gone into the ocean. But will it continue? Perhaps not. So a healthy, resilient ocean will be able to continue to help us reach our climate targets. The problem is we don't observe it well enough to know what's happening in the ocean, even in the short term. Next, click, please. So what you can see is this is the Global Ocean Observing System. It looks as if the whole ocean is being beautifully observed. Next click, please. However, if you actually look at this in detail, many of these sensors that you see in the ocean do not even observe carbon. They are old. They are measuring once a year. They're not there anymore. Next slide, please. And so you can see that we're not actually measuring what we think we're measuring. Just one more click, please. And finally, one more click again on the slide, please. That's right. So you can see that they were losing time series and we're not actually continuing to observe the ocean. And the last uh, click, please, on the next slide. We do know the Global Ocean Observing System is a network of networks internationally. Experts know how to observe the ocean, but they need your support and they need government supports in getting to that. And we're very lucky to be working with the IOC, with Vladimir um, Ryabinin and the Great Ocean Decade team. And together we'll be able to bring a lot more awareness to these critical issues for ocean observation. So from Canada, from a rich, cold, active, energetic ocean with high biodiversity, Let's hope that we can continue to move in the direction of a healthy and resilient ocean and an ocean that is well observed. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Waite, uh, and uh, much appreciated your contribution. And we look forward to the discussion that follows uh, later. And you, of course, will join the discussion as well. So thank you so much. We move on now to our next speaker. Jamaluddin Jompa is a marine ecologist and he's also professor at Hasanuddin University in Makassar, Indonesia. Currently serves as Dean of the Graduate School and uh, Chairman of the Center of Excellence for Marine Resilience and Sustainable Development. And he was recently, amongst many, many other uh, accolades, he was recently elected to the prestigious Indonesian Academy of Science. Uh, Jamaluddin Jompa, it's very good to have you with us. And and, uh, well, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Jamal Jompa. I'm speaking from Indonesia. Uh, it is now actually about 
midnight here in Indonesia, but I'm so excited that I'm not feeling uh, anything but being so optimistic and to uh, to see all the presentations uh, tonight, especially talking about uh, marine resilience. Can I have uh, one slide only of my presentation, please? Um, is there any chance? Anyway, um, I would like to share information about um, the condition of Indonesian uh, coral reefs uh, in the center of uh, the coral triangle. Um, I, I hope everybody uh, understand about uh, the place where when you talk about a uh, healthy ocean, uh, one of the uh, indicators is uh, uh, biodiversity. And we are proud to actually always announce that the center of uh, coral triangle is also uh, known as the most diverse, um, uh, not only coral species, but at the same time, it is actually the center of marine biodiversity of, of this planet. Uh, let me introduce only for Indonesian uh, area, where it is uh, known as, as the best uh, reef in the world. Um, However, we are, uh, as many other part of the world in this area, in the tropical, in the developed country, uh, although we are one of the most diverse coral reefs, the most, uh, the richest uh, species, but we are also facing uh, multiple pressures, uh, not only from uh, classic anthropogenic, uh, such as uh, pollution, including plastic or microplastic, uh, sedimentation, uh, blast and cyanide fishing, uh, infection, uh, disease, uh, crown of thorns, uh, starfish or cantaster, uh, overfishing, and most recently, actually, uh, with climate change um, and ocean acidification. So um, we wish, actually, we will enjoy the healthy and resilient uh, uh, reefs all the time in Indonesia, but uh, in the last decade, uh, it is a bad news from here that uh, bleaching events uh, have taken place uh, more frequently and uh, more severely. So um, our recent uh, data on uh, coral reef status in Indonesia, if you see uh, the color code there, uh, the red uh, is degraded and uh, the yellow is uh, moderate and the good one is the, the green one. Uh, and some very few of them in the excellent condition. This is actually uh, based on the coral uh, life coral cover uh, uh, and and uh, fish reef fish abundance and also uh, water quality uh, as well as uh, the cover of uh, fleshy macroalgae. Uh, it is uh, uh, quite uh, well uh, described here the the condition of Coral reef all over Indonesia is uh, still uh, dominated by a yellow color, which is actually um, in what it, uh, moderate condition or not very good condition. But in many places, including my hometown, is already in degraded uh, situation. So um, our government and uh, we are being um, helped by many other uh, agency. And uh, uh, let me also use this opportunity to invite all partners all over the world to come and help this uh, most important uh, uh, place for coral reef in the world to uh, be uh, proactive in developing many uh, uh, programs such as uh, developing marine protected area. And more recently, we're actually trying to uh, maintain the resilience, uh, not only by uh, a well-managed, but also we are developing uh, a technology on uh, proactive coral restoration, uh, not only to restore corals, but also to maintain the uh, uh, fish population to be able to really uh, make this situation, the, the ecosystems more resilient. One click, please, I forgot. We wish actually that everyone appreciate that this area, uh, one click, please, uh, no more. One more slide. Okay, uh, this area is again uh, genetically the most diverse and we do hope that uh, we appreciate and we are hoping for a good future of the best coral reef that we can still maintain to see in Indonesia. Thank you so much. Looking forward to see you all. 
Thank you so much, Professor Jumper. And we look forward to discussion. Of course, uh, you will stay tuned and join the discussion later on as well. We we'll move on to our next uh, speaker, and uh, we're talking about Dr. Aisha Manlosa. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research in Bremen, Germany. As a social scientist, she applies uh, qualitative and mixed method approaches in interdisciplinary research to address pressing sustainability issues in the context of the global south. Uh, Dr. Manlosa, we very much look forward uh, to your impulse right now. So over to you. Thank you very much for having me here this afternoon. Um, could we have the presentation up in the screen, please? Yes, so how do we envision a healthy and resilient ocean? The Collins Dictionary defines vision as seeing a situation as what we imagine or hope it would be like in the future if things were different from the way they are now. The word visioning or envisioning in the title of this presentation calls to my mind a quote written by the author Roald Dahl. In James and the Giant Peach, as some of you may know, one of the characters said, well, maybe it started that way as a dream, but doesn't everything. And how we envision a healthy and resilient ocean is important because it shapes our collective conversations and our conversations and ideas shape how we act in the world. The first point I want to make is that the way we define and understand ocean problems frames how we formulate solutions. If we perceive ocean problems such as pollution as being largely technical that can be solved with more or better technologies, then we would draw on our growing suite of technological solutions. If we perceive <clears throat> problems as being caused by human presence in natural ecosystems, then we might consider excluding humans from certain spaces. But if we understand the problem of ocean health and resilience as being constituted by a complex gamut of sociocultural, technological, political, and ecological factors that are all interrelated, then we expand our visions for a healthy and resilient ocean, and we widen the scope within which we seek out solutions. Next slide, please. Oceans are often depicted or imagined in the human mind as something that is out there. It is a vast space that is far from us, that is different from the land on which we live in day by day. And this can make it easy to view oceans as separate from us. And so the second point I would like to emphasize is the importance of framing oceans as social ecological systems. And that is the health and resilience of our oceans is intertwined with the health and resilience of our societies, as was earlier mentioned. Healthy oceans are essential to human survival and to human well-being. And healthy and resilient societies support and enable healthy and resilient oceans. Next slide, please. When speaking of um, healthy and resilient oceans, we must speak of oceans, of visions, and of future in the plural term. Within the global community, there are plural oceans to speak of, as is represented by the experts that we have here with us today. Um, and while we all have a stake on the global health and resilience of our oceans, these oceans are also in specific places. There are specific cultures, values, social relations, social structures, and power asymmetries that influence how the futures of our oceans are envisioned, discussed, and deliberated. And we need to foreground plurality and diversity to accommodate people's diverse voices and visions. For example, the video that we watched earlier, which is a collection of statements around the world and is accessible in the event platform, is an example of seeking to capture such plurality of visions and voices. In closing, to me, there are multiple dimensions to a healthy and resilient ocean. A requirement, a primary requirement for a healthy and resilient ocean is clean and unpolluted water. 
it is one where biodiversity thrives and is able to keep the planet's climate stable. Finally, it is one that supports the flourishing of healthy human populations, whether through the provisioning of nutritious food and of sustainable livelihoods and the maintenance of sustainable human nature relations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Manloza, again. You are on standby to join the discussion. I'm sure there are lots of questions coming your way and the way of the other panelists. We have one more speaker, and I would now like to welcome Dr. Subrata Sarkar. He is an assistant professor of the Department of Oceanography at uh, Shah Jalal University of Science and Technology in Bangladesh. His teaching and research areas include blue economy, marine ecology, nonlinear dynamics modeling, and coastal oceanography. Uh, Dr. Sarkar, so very good to have you with us and we look forward to your presentation now. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, could I have my slide, please? Yeah. So I will start uh, with one of my discussion with a fisherman from Bangladesh. So last month, I was uh, traveling uh, to an island for my research. And there I met one fisherman. And then I asked him this question, how is the health of ocean around you? And then uh, he showed me some scenarios. And I captured those scenarios. Next slide, please. So here you can see the, those scenarios. In the first picture, uh, this is the mangrove canal. So people are using this canal as the dumping ground of plastics. And in the second picture, you can see the plastic materials like uh, plastic bottles, then uh, plastic bags and discarded fishing nets. These are scattered on the beach, sea beach. And in the third picture, you can see a mangrove forest where you will find the fishing nets. So when fishermen, uh, do not use these nets, they just throw it uh, to the mangrove forest. And the fourth picture is really interesting. One uh, monkey is trying to eat uh, the bottle of soft drinks, which is made of plastic. So these are the scenarios of plastic pollution from an island. So the answer of uh, that fisherman was the coastal water is not healthy, at least the environment where he is living is not healthy. Next slide, please. And then I went uh, to the offshore water, offshore area with him, and then he pointed out to the water, and then he said, see, this is a clear water, so this might be healthy. So this is the common understanding uh, from a fisherman in Bangladesh. But if we go for uh, scientific evidence, more detailed study, then the scenario is similar and even more worse. Because in Bangladesh, we have coral patches, there we have uh, coral bleaching, and then these plastics which are thrown to the water, these are broken down into smaller species, which we call microplastics. So we are having microplastics in water, in sediment, and then in marine fishes. And we, uh, the fishermen, they are releasing their discarded fishing nets to the water. And then fishing boats, they are uh, releasing oils to the water. So all these are making the uh, coastal ecosystem as well as ocean ecosystem very unhealthy. So what we can do to improve our ocean, to improve our uh, health of ocean? Of course, we need policy, we need laws, we need regulations, everything. But to me, first of all, we need observation. If we do not have any data, then we cannot talk anything about the situation of the ocean. So if you want to say this is changing, then we need data. For that, we need ocean observation. But for developing country, ocean uh, observation is always expensive. So if something is uh, less expensive, so if, uh, we can develop some less expensive equipment for ocean observation. That would be very great for ocean observation in the uh, developing countries. And the second thing is to improve our understanding as well as to change our behavior to ocean. 
So if we do not change our behavior, if we go to the sea beach and then we throw all the trashes, all the plastics to the sea beach, and then we use the waterway, we just throw all the plastic bottles to the water, then the health of the ocean will not improve. So we need to improve, our, we need to change our behavior to ocean. We need to build awareness among the people. We need to make the people literate about the ocean. So if we do this, then if we will understand the value of ocean, then we will understand if ocean health is bad, then it will be bad for us. If ocean health is good, then it will be good for our for present generation and future generation. So the only thing is the we need to improve our understanding and then build awareness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sarkar. And uh, those were the four impulses we got for this session. We're ready for a discussion now after all this input. But I would like to invite three more experts to join the discussion, namely Dr. Sophie Siaf. She's the CEO of the Partnership for Observation of the Global Ocean, based at Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the United Kingdom. Her role involves leading the delivery of the POGO, or the POGO program, which uh, she also represents at the international and intergovernmental level. Very warm welcome, Dr. Sioff. We also welcome Nelson Lagos Suarez. He's a marine biologist uh, and a full professor at the Faculty of Sciences and the director of the Research and Innovation Center for Climate Change at the University of Santo Tomas at Santiago, Chile. And last but not least, we also welcome Dr. Jacqueline Uku. Uh, she's the president of the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. She's developed a career as a seagrass scientist, and she served as a technical member of the National Blue Economy Technical Committee and continues to support the Kenyan team for the high-level panel for ocean science. So now we have a fantastic panel with seven outstanding scientists and experts. So of course, we need some outstanding experts steering this discussion, which is why I'm happy to hand over now to Karen and Tim. And you, of course, are welcome to submit your questions. Now, whether I will pass these questions on or whether Karen and Tim just include them in their discussion, we'll wait and see. But for now, it's over to the two of you. Yes, welcome, everybody. Um, and I'd like to open this up um, by asking Sophie, maybe, to just give us a little bit on her views on what's important um, for a healthy and resilient ocean. And particularly, Sophie, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you see um, citizens and capacity uh, in, with regard to this. OK, thank you very much. So what, what I, I'd like to say is, is really following up on what Anya and uh, Shubrata mentioned in their impulse lectures is really the need to observe the ocean. And we often uh, in marine science talk about having to monitor the vital signs or taking the pulse of the global ocean uh, as if the ocean were a human being. So how does that actually equate to... Um, you know, how do these vital signs translate to the ocean? So we, we do things like measuring uh, temperature, salinity, pH, dissolved oxygen and nutrients. Uh, but really to, to evaluate the health of the ocean, we need to look at the life within it uh, and particularly things like biodiversity and uh, ecosystem functioning. So, so one thing I'd like to say is, is really how important it is for us to improve the way we look at uh, biology in the ocean. We, we've done very well so far in developing physical and biogeochemical measurements of the ocean, but not so well with uh, being able to monitor biodiversity and biological um, parameters on a continuous and global basis. Um, so in, in terms of what can we do, uh, and particularly with, with citizens, um, I think there's, there's been a, a really interesting move towards the use of citizen science uh, to help scientists to observe the oceans, uh, recognising that, um, the, the, recognising the importance of coastal observations and to 
be able to monitor right up to the coastlines. Um, we can really use the help of, of citizens and fishermen, uh, recreational users of coastal waters uh, and so on. And uh, in doing that, we can not only get support for um, monitoring the ocean, but we can also educate uh, and empower uh, citizens to, to really understand the problems that the, uh, the coastal ocean is facing and to help find solutions. Uh, so, so Pogo is is engaged in uh, in a few of these citizen science initiatives, um, uh, particularly developing uh, low cost instruments that uh, can be used by citizens um, with uh, connectivity to to smartphones and and smartphone applications. Uh, to so one one project is developing a, a low cost sensor to measure temperature. Um, or that can be uh, deployed from a, a recreational uh, canoe or boat or fishing boat. Um, and, uh, and the other citizen science project we have is, um, is um, looking at marine, um, marine litter on beaches and engaging school children to help uh, monitor plastic pollution on beaches, uh, particularly in, in African countries. Um, so, so I, I think I'll just wrap up my uh, my intervention there. I think that those are a, a couple of ideas and, and activities that Pogo in particular is engaged in. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sophie. That's a good intro, intro to this, and maybe you can take it from there, Tim. That was definitely a very global aspect that you that you mentioned, a global statement. But of course, we also have large regional differences, and we are also glad to have a voice from South America. Nelson, thank you for joining us from Chile. And Chile is a very special country, I would say, in this country because you have a very long coastline. Your country is stretching from the tropical to almost polar latitudes. So a variety of coastal and marine ecosystems uh, that are uh, that you have a strong relationship with. And um, so if we think in terms of uh, ocean resilience, the marine resilience, um, how is it, uh, how is it uh, going on there in, in Chile? And, and can you, is there only one opinion that you have for Chile or do you have to uh, look at different uh, ecosystems and are there in different states or are there uh, are different actions needed in several of these areas? Thank you for the question. Yes, as you mentioned, Chile has a huge uh, diversity of marine ecosystems from the tropical zone or to the, into, to the polar zone or near polar ecosystem in the Patagonia. So it, it, it's hard to, to describe the state of this ecosystem because we have uh, making measurements and observation about the, the state of this ecosystem, but the diversity reduce our opportunity to have a full understanding about that. However, for instance, in terms of the, the, the resilient capacity of the ecosystem in the, in the region, uh, from the 80s, um, scientific uh, marine ecologists have uh, demonstrated, for instance, the role of removing the pressures uh, like overexploitation or pollution or upon the near shore ecosystem. And, and when we, when this pressure was removed, uh, the ecosystem showed uh, a quite fast uh, capacity for uh, return to the previous state. So I, I think that this, it, it, this quality is heavily uh, demonstrated. Uh, it's a quite demonstration about the self-reviving system that the nature have that can help us to strain resilient in different parts of the world or in different ecosystems. I think that this information that was uh, uh, performed by um, Dr. Juan Carlos Castilla, that, who was my mentor uh, in my studies of my PhD, he, he demonstrated that when we exclude humans, for instance, we can rebuild a um, heavily exploited uh, coastal population of benthic resource. And this uh, restoring process, this self-restoring process is part of the uh, uh, capacity of the ecosystem that is in our hands. We have 
we, we need to make this uh, action and surely the nation will demonstrate the, their self repairing capacity and restore the, the, the structure and function of this ecosystem. So, of, of course, we don't have so much information for the broad ecosystem in, in, in Chile or for other areas, or, or this kind of process can occur in a fast way as we see in Chile. But um, I am confident that we can uh, be more active uh, in terms of to rebuild the, the marine biodiversity and ecosystem and rely in the resilience capacity of this ecosystem to achieve uh, this goal. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. Well, that's a statement. That seems to be a ray of hope. And um, let's move on. Now we jump to Africa. We have Jacqueline there from Kenya and being the president from, of WIOMSA. We are living in a world of acronyms today. Fortunately, Monica was reading it out in full. Um, so you are originally a seagrass ecologist, but of course you're engaged a, a, a bit more for the ocean. Can you tell us what BIOMSA does and, and what is so special possibly of your region in the Western Indian Ocean? Um. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question. Indeed, uh, WIOMSA is a long acronym and I'll break it down by saying that WIOMSA stands for the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. And it's an association of scientists and institutions that uh, our members, we come together on a common platform. And this platform engages scientists all the way from Somalia to South Africa and the island states in our region. So we are comprised of 10 countries. Um, what is special about uh, our region is the fact that scientists are beginning to talk into policy. Scientists are getting opportunities through WIOMSA and different uh, platforms to be able to contribute. And I think um, this is something that we are deeply proud of, simply because uh, we find ourselves able to contribute to trending topics. Uh, for us in our region, it's blue economy. Um, all coastlines are looking at blue economy and how we can harness a bit more from our economy uh, of the ocean, uh, looking beyond uh, just fishing to tourism, mining, uh, energy and other aspects. And uh, scientists are coming together to look at these issues and to speak into policy. But I'd just like to uh, indicate that our region still has the problems that have been highlighted uh, on this platform. We see pollution. Um, our, we have several coastal cities that are growing in population. And so pollution will be uh, something that is very, very visible. Uh, in some places, our seas are no longer as blue as the seas we saw in Bangladesh. We are seeing plastics. Um, we are seeing bleaching of coral reefs due to temperature increments. And we see overfishing because of the demand. Again, the trend of blue economy, we link very strongly with uh, fishing. Um, what is key for us is the fact that um, we have to begin to understand that we cannot have an economy or a blue economy without a healthy ocean. And um, we have to recognize the uniqueness, the biodiversity, because we are a unique region. We have a rich biodiversity of several species. If I work in seagrasses, we have 12 seagrasses compared with many regions of the world that are monospecific. So we find um, there is room for resilience, which is unique for the region, simply because of the high biodiversity. And this is something we should strive and we are working to strive to protect in order to ensure that our oceans remain healthy. Thank you. Thank you for your statement from the tropics. And we move on to the high latitudes. Yeah, I, actually, I've just been uh, thinking about this. Uh, all of you so far have actually continuously mentioned that citizens and the role of citizens and your average person, let's put it out there, whatever an average person is anywhere in the world, I mean, who's to say, um, 
are, are, is, are definitely extremely important in moving us forward. And Anya, um, as you are the chief of the world's global observing network, um, I'd just like to ask you how you see us scientists, um, I'm actually some sort of a funny type of scientist as well, but um, you know, we cannot go it alone anymore out there. We, we need the help, in my view, and from what everybody's been saying, um, of, uh, of citizens. And, and can you see some way of integrating this on the ground science, as I would like to say, this in situ, we live this issue science in, in a global observing uh, system? And maybe the rest of you might like to have an opinion on that as well. But Anya, maybe you could start with this um, uh, and just see how you how we go. Sure. Thanks so much. You know, that's a great question because the global ocean observing systems all over the world urgently need input from citizens. And we need to connect to citizens in a number of ways because we need to know how to observe and how to pull together information from the ocean to deliver to communities and other um, others who need it. So if we are not having the conversation with communities and with citizens who are working in and by the ocean, we don't know what to observe, how to observe, and how to pull it together. One of the things that um, we've been discussing recently uh, with Pogo colleagues and others is that the critical next step is to figure out, well, how to synthesize and deliver this information in a way that is meaningful. Because scientists... Uh, many of us are sitting around in our silos measuring, you know, our temperature and salinity and understanding the ocean currents. But do, who does that matter for and why? So I think the key question is, how do we... Sim so I think, uh, yes, we need to observe the ocean. Now, I guess that was the original point from me and also Subrata and others. But to but why? To what end, right? So we need to then pivot and say, how do we deliver that information in a, in a clear and meaningful way. And that is, I think, the challenge for most ocean observers, many of whom are scientists. And, you know, let's be honest, communication not often are a strong suit, right? Um, so I think it's engaging people with communication expertise, figuring out how to turn data into beautiful information products that can be shared with citizens. And then on, the, on a contrasting side, getting citizens engaged in observations for their own uh, benefit. And uh, we see this in Canada with our uh, deeper and deeper engagement with our Indigenous communities, where it's critical that our coastal communities that have been hit by food shortages and the uh, collapse of fish stocks, and uh, that, that they're engaged in ways that are meaningful to them. Even small things, for example, we have some underwater camera systems, and we get citizens to assess those pictures as almost like a recreational activity. And then we say, well, let's pitch you against the expert. They can test their um, assessment against the expert assessment. And what that does is gives us data to say, oh, this citizen actually is a really, really good assessor. And then we start to pull in um, individual citizens' uh, assessments of these data into the global picture. So I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of positive things going forward that we can be doing. But convincing ourselves that this is the right way forward, getting those resourced, and then getting the energy behind them to action. And I think this is some place where the UN decade can have a big impact, um, where we're talking about capacity building, we're talking about ocean literacy, which is sort of short term for understanding the ocean um, by citizens. I think this is an opportunity for us to step out and say, okay, let's invest not just in sensing and observing the ocean, but in synthesizing those observations into a meaningful form to engage and discuss with communities. And I think that would be a big step that the, that the decade um, could champion. Thank you very much, Anya. <laughs> Isa, I saw you nodding. Um, you're in a way a bit, uh, let's say, the alien in the group. Though you're the only social scientist among a lot of natural scientists. And I think quite often in this type of research we are doing, social scientists are a bit underrepresented. And, and you are dealing not with the environment, but with people, people's perceptions, etc. So if we t pick this question up, or the, the, um, how to involve people, what is your opinion on that? 
Um, thank you very much for this um, question, Tim, and for allowing me to, to be here and to represent a social science perspective in the conversation. Um, I think that in, in my impulse lecture earlier, I spoke about the value of, um, of plura plurality, sorry, and of valuing um, diverse voices uh, among diverse groups of people. And I mentioned that because there are different ways that we value the oceans and how we value them, whether in economic, material, social, or, or cultural term, shapes the policies that we create, the actions that we undertake, and how we engage with the ocean. And the values that people, citizens, hold for their oceans are often plural. It includes the values of oceans for their livelihoods and um, for recreation or for their, uh, their identity as a culture. And often these values drive grassroots movements or community-based initiatives by which people in their specific places um, patrol oceans, for example. Um, in the Philippines, there is what we call bantay dagat or sea guards, which are um, ordinary citizens who work with local governments to patrol their oceans that are within their jurisdiction, protect the oceans, and um, and these people know their oceans, having worked there and, and lived there for years. And I think connecting to what was already said, tapping on, working with um, people in specific places, bringing in their values, their, their deep knowledge of the oceans, um, as well as the resources that they have in their communities and the strengths is really key to ensuring that we promote a healthy and resilient ocean that we all um, wish or long for, dream for, but also act towards realizing um, in the future. Thank you, Isa. And um, this brings us um, maybe back to, to places where a lot of people live. And Jamal, it's good to have you with us. Good to see you after such a long time. And thank you for staying up late. And uh, it's good to have you. You already mentioned the, the importance of the coral triangle for marine biodiversity, as well as the threats that are existing from climate change, as well as human uses. And, um, and you also have a, a very large population in Indonesia, a lot of people living uh, along the coast and also economically depending on the natural resources of the coast. So so to my opinion, you mentioned the coral restoration efforts. Um, there must be a lot of competing interests in, in marine food production um, and this coral reef restoration. Do you think the corals will still be there by the end of this decade? How, do, how, how can you manage that? Yes, uh, thanks Tim for a very um, a challenging question actually. Uh, uh, I cannot answer whether the coral is still there. Uh, uh, for sure, coral uh, will be there for, for still very long time. But the, the real question is uh, what kind of coral if they will see in the next decades. Uh, I believe uh, Indonesian uh, coral reef actually naturally quite resilient. I was actually a bit pessimistic, uh, maybe uh, early 2000 when bleaching finally hit Indonesia and we, we got quite a scary uh, condition at the time. But from time to time, uh, I noticed that every time I went diving, uh, actually uh, uh, our coral reefs are quite resilient from, uh, still quite resilient from uh, a current uh, climate change. But uh, the prediction of IPCC, we know that uh, the next uh, maybe uh, uh, 20 or 30 years scenario from now, uh, we, know, we never know whether this uh, uh, can, can still be able to um, adapt with this uh, high temperature. Uh, however, um, the most challenging actually, Tim, is as you mentioned, that 80% uh, of Indonesian coral reefs actually uh, were threatened by anthropogenic. Uh, on the same time, uh, the people are rely on coral reefs, mostly for the small islands uh, 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 society. Uh, therefore, this is something that the, the citizens that we are talking about, actually Indonesian uh, context, we, we more uh, put it as a, a public awareness, education. So the citizens are actually in the center. And the citizens need to understand also the consequence of not managing uh, or, or not um, managing uh, the, the uh, maintaining the health of corrupts because they will eventually rely on this. But at the same time, um, it is actually um, also important for them to 
be proactive in uh, making sure that uh, the recovery process uh, actually is taking place. And this is actually education also need to be uh, on, on, on site, uh, especially for Indonesian large population, uh, not only the uh, we are so diverse in language and culture, but actually also uh, the place, uh, some, many of them are quite uh, a very remote area. So, and, and the remote place is mostly also with low education. So our challenge really is also to put uh, the citizens not only for involving, but also to, to ensure the education and uh, 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 stewardship need to be developed uh, or public awareness. And hopefully, you know, collectively we can help each other we can help the government and we can help the industry to still growing uh, also other potential for Indonesian economy, which is uh, tourism. Oh. So I quite complicated thing, but I'm afraid I'm taking too long time. <laughs> Okay, but we immediately have to come back to ISA now because you are now working in Germany, but you were born also in the Coral Triangle in the Philippines, which is also a large population. And uh, you are also working on food production and food security. So that's a big issue. That's probably one of the largest conflicts mentioned there. So what is your view on this? Was the question directed to me? Yes, it was directed to you as being you somebody much. also live or, or were born in the Coral Triangle. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is something that the Philippines um, highly depends on and um, and benefits from the biodiversity that comes from the Coral Triangle and the spillover of um, fish that provides food and livelihoods to millions who are in capture fisheries, but not only in relation to to capture fishing, um, a lot of aquaculture ponds as well are located along the coasts that interact with the, co uh, with the ocean um, and also produce fish and other aquatic food for people. And so the interaction of, of land and sea is also very important um, in that regard. However, um, in areas where I have worked, particularly in Bulacan, which is quite um, near the capital Manila, the similar issues of um, impacts of climate change that are um, and pollution as well coming from different sources, whether from large scale intensive aquaculture, industrial facilities or domestic residential spaces um, are really putting pressure on the production of aquatic food and pushing a lot of people down into poverty because of um, less fish catch or even less harvest for small scale fish farmers. Um, this is a problem that people discuss a lot, that people lobby their local governments for, but it's also important to realize that it's a scale issue, that people who have strengths at the community grassroots level need support from national government because addressing these problems and realizing a healthy and resilient ocean require systemic transformation that engages with policies and structures um, that underpin the current system that lead to um, pollution in this area. So I really see connections there. And um, I think these communities, whether from Indonesia and the Philippines, can also learn very much from each other and fostering these exchanges um, from not only from scientists, but, but citizens will be very important as well. Thank you. Okay, um, you know, the interesting thing is we've got two questions in from the chat, which are in a way similar. And um, Subrata, I'm going to sort of throw them at you a little bit to start off, because, but I think everybody should engage here. Um, and the point is that Everybody have, has diff have different demands on observations, right? Um, the a citizen will have a different demand on an observation than a physicist. And for example, um, yeah, you know, a physicist might say, actually, you might be wanting to monitor ocean noise better. And a fisheries expert might be saying, actually, you might want to do the biodiversity observing or the ecological monitoring better. Um, and you know, that is also very dependent where you are in the world. And Subrata, I know that you're very involved in trying to get citizens to involved in observing programs, which also involve some technology and, um, yeah, more physical types of monitoring. Um, how do you feel about the disjunct 
interconnectedness between science and what we monitor at the moment and, and citizens. And maybe the rest of you can also jump in on this question. Are we measuring the right things? And can we observe uh, the right things? So, Sobrati, would you like to start? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, if you think about the developing world, so what is the status of ocean observation? So for ocean observation, we need uh, highly equipped uh, ship and also the expensive equipment. So if we go for that, it's quite, uh, I would say, a bit very much difficult for developing countries. In such case, what we can do, especially for the developing countries like Bangladesh. So one option is to engage the community. Because if we engage the local community, if we practice the citizen science, then it would be much easier. For example, um, if you, if let's say we, we, we have a CTD, so what we will do, do with CTD? We will measure temperature, salinity, all this stuff. But to go to the sea, we need a ship, but we do not have any research vessel to go to the deep sea area. So what is the solution? The only solution is to engage the local people, for example, fishermen. So they have boat fishing boats. So if we have less expensive uh, instruments, we can just attach uh, to their boats and then we can ask them to collect this data. So these, these data will be automatically recorded to these equipments. Uh, then we can uh, collect those data. But before that, we need to do something. Like we need to translate the data in such a way that they realize that these data are very useful for them. For example, to conserve their fishes, to increase their fishes production. So once they realize that these data, they're collecting for themselves, for their future, then it will be easy. So for developing countries like Bangladesh, of course, we need engagement of local people. We need to practice the citizen science in, in this way uh, to monitor the ocean. Otherwise, it will be, be difficult or it will be, we have to wait for a long time to start monitoring, uh, large-scale monitoring program. Okay, can I, can I just jump in there again? Because I think it would be really interesting uh, in the wrap-up now of this particular panel session to um, ask, for example, Sophie um, and those running large um, monitoring programs the clear question whether we actually are monitoring the right things. For example, is ocean noise um, monitored enough and is it an essential ocean variable? Do we have the ability to actually look at um, yeah, shifts in, for example, ecosystem function and biodiversity? Do we have the methodologies? And the last but not least, but also in this block, is do we not need to engage the people on the ground? So which, per, which of you is going to answer that, that, that conglomerate of questions first? Sophie, maybe? I, I, I can give it a go. I, I, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, a couple of times, actually, uh, the issue of ocean noise, uh, because this is very much something that is of interest to POGO uh, and um, our partner organization SCORE, and together we co-sponsor co a program on uh, ocean sound. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've been working uh, and successfully had uh, ocean sound recognized by Goose as an essential ocean variable. Uh, so, so this is something that came from the community and uh, that there was a general consensus um, among the scientific community that ocean sound uh, was essential to measure um, uh, among a, a high number of other parameters. So the, the issue is really how do we prioritize because there's a very long list of essential ocean variables recognized by Goose and uh, without the funding to, to to monitor all of them continuously everywhere, um, there needs to be some sort of prioritization. And I think to try to answer your question about how, how do we involve the people, I think uh, you know different countries have different needs, and and I think the the prioritization has to be done. Uh, to a certain extent at uh, regional or, or national level, depending on what the priorities of the country are 
whether it's fishing, whether it's plastic pollution, um, you know, coral reef and, and other um, important ecosystems that are being degraded. Um, and, uh, and there needs to be a, a kind of uh, bottom-up approach to, to defining what the priorities are and aligning the ocean observations to, to addressing those priorities, to supporting the, the local uh, economy, the blue economy, supporting livelihoods, um, and, uh, and at the same time conserving the, uh, the, the coastal resources. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that, that's the, the way to go. Yeah, maybe we can move on. There's one interesting question uh, in the chat from the audience coming, which is uh, connecting the, the global and the local problems that we have. How can we, we reduce both industrial scale fishing operations and illegal, unreported and underreported fisheries while protecting small scale traditional fishing practices? I think this is a question I want to direct uh, towards uh, Jacqueline and Nelson, maybe, because uh, fisheries, I think, is, a, is an issue there. And you may face uh, a local problem because global fleets of uh, fisheries are taking away the resources. So what are your opinions? Thank you for that. Um, the way to go, and I know this is a, a problem in our region, or it's something that we recognize, is the strengthening of fisheries management regimes, ensuring that we have enough surveillance uh, going out uh, in the ocean and uh, taking the necessary steps. We are beginning, I know the country I am in, in Kenya, We recently uh, uh, set up a coast guard. Uh, we have set up a vessel monitoring systems to be able to have the adequate technology to recognize where the issues are and begin to handle them. This is not an easy uh, issue. Uh, it's actually a global issue. Uh, there's a lot of global and high level dialogue uh, that has been ongoing. And it's not an issue that a country like uh, individual countries can resolve um, single-handedly. It's an issue that requires global uh, partnership and interventions because a lot of the fleet come from countries way beyond our shores. And so um, we do need to strengthen regimes that support uh, surveillance and reporting of catches uh, as required. Thank you. Nelson, it's... Thank you. Well, well it, it is a, as you mentioned, it's a global problem with the local implication and it's very hard or, or difficult to, to, to catch uh, and, and, and contabilize within the, uh, the observation of the landings of the fisheries, for instance. The, 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 the illegal fisheries in, occur in different areas Uh, cannot to make a proper evaluation of the state of the system. So we need a coordination, of course, better observation system and uh, 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 controlling system for the float operation at global scale and impacting local uh, fisheries. So we need to, to look and find the way to protect this kind of uh, local communities and the uh, It's strange the way in the, what they are managing the, the resource in which they rely the incomes for it. So it's, it's a very huge problem that is interesting that we need this kind of panel will be highlighted with a with, with a major problem that we need to tackle in the short term. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nelson. Wow, that was good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Karen, Karen and Tim, uh, and of course the entire panel. Uh, that was fascinating, fascinating to listen to. Uh, and of course, I mean, questions raised there, like are we monitoring the right things and how do we engage citizens and people? And that is actually something that we will follow up uh, after a break. So a big thank you again and a, a round of virtual applause to our fantastic expert speakers there joining us. Uh, 10 minutes break. 
but you can use to make yourself a cup of tea or coffee, stretch your legs, or else stay put uh, with the online platform uh, where you can listen to more voices from around the world or check out how to apply to join the expert roster to support the IOC and the Ocean Decade. Whatever you do, make sure to be back here 10 minutes from now. See you then.
Ich denke, wir Menschen tun nicht genug für unsere Meere. Weil man sieht das ja selbst an den Korallenriffen. Die zerfallen alle. Blöderweise. Meine Vision auch von einer gesunden Ozean ist sauberes und mit dem erfülltes Ozean, wo Pflanzen und Tiere leben können, so dass die Menschen, die an den Küsten leben, durch Fischwerk eine, bis ein leichteres Leben haben. Das ist meine Forschung zu einem gesunden Ozean. Wir sollten weniger Ölperformen bauen, weil es den Tieren stört und es ist zu laut. Und das ist giftig für die Tiere. Und wir sollten weniger Plastik ins Ozean werfen. Dort ist nicht mehr Plastik in das Ozean. Jedes Meer Meerestier ist gesund und glücklich. My vision of a healthy ocean is clear blue water without trash. Colorful corals that are not bleached or dead with many fish and without oil platform. In my vision, I can see clean beaches with clean sand and without plastic. My vision of a healthy ocean is when there is no more plastic in the ocean and there are no more dying corals. My vision of a healthy ocean is color for corals and more fish into water and fever plastic. Bye! For me, a healthy ocean is the ocean that we humans don't harm anymore, for example, with plastic or oil or any other waste. Um, so the different ecosystem from the ocean can further exist. The vision of a healthy ocean is that there is no plastic, no CO2 and no rubbish in it. All the sea animals should be able to swim happily and free. I think humans aren't enough concerned about ocean health because they are not thinking about ocean health and if they would think about it, they would destroy the oceans anyways. People are selfish. They only think about themselves. I hope it will change. My vision of a healthy ocean is that the animals have freedom and do not have to eat plastic. That's not what they deserve. I think the ocean is not healthy because humans always throw garbage in it and pollute it. Als Wissenschaftlerin, aber vor allen Dingen als Mensch, sind gesunde Meere für mich ein Ort der Hoffnung. Der Hoffnung auf Lösungsansätze von der Natur und für die Natur. The importance of a healthy ocean goes beyond human perspective. A well-being marine venting community plays a new role on the global carbon cycle and on the long run controlling climate changes in both continental and marine environments. I think the ocean is not healthy because there is much plastic in it and the ocean will warm up and the corals will die. We kill the homes for animals and plants. Gesundes Meer bedeutet für mich in allererster Linie sauberes Wasser. Ozeane sind Schatzkammern der Biodiversität auf diesem Planeten. Wir als Nationalpark wollen uns anstrengen, dass das für uns, für die Natur, aber auch für die Menschen auf der Welt so bleibt. Welcome back. Uh, it's time for our next session in this Ocean Decade Laboratory, A Healthy and Resilient Ocean. And if you were listening during uh, the break just now, uh, you could hear some more voices from around the globe, uh, normal citizens, people from all walks of life uh, expressing what they think a healthy and resilient ocean looks like and what it should look like. And this is exactly what we're going to do in this session now, namely asking ordinary people from all walks of life what their idea of a healthy ocean is because after all that is one of the aims of the ocean decade to engage citizens and get their input uh, we all live on the same planet we all share the same ocean so it is only right that everyone has a say and that we listen to their input and we're starting right now with the younger generation and bring in students from the Kippenberg Senior School or Gymnasium in Bremen. And we have two representatives of uh, that school with us here, Sophie Wolf and Annelie Czankiewicz. Uh, hello.
hello, first of all, to the two of you. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, you, of course, will join uh, the panel discussion later as well. Uh, but you did prepare a video for us on behalf of the entire class. Uh, and we're going to watch that first, if that's OK. So let's roll the video. Our vision of a healthy ocean is that it's not harm or strongly influenced by humans. This means that the ocean is free from plastic, oil and other waste. In order for the ocean to be cleaner, we have to expand technologies to collect garbage and prevent that more garbage gets in the ocean. We can accomplish that by reducing the consumption of plastic and developing environmentally friendly ways of garbage disposal. Another idea could be to reward people, for example fishers, who pick up trash. In addition to that, we have to create stricter rules of garbage disposal. All of us have to use less plastic in our everyday life and for example use bioplastic. We especially have to export less trash and recycle or dispose it in our own countries. This way we have more control over the waste management. Another aspect is that we have to conservate and protect the marine biodiversity. This includes the conservation and reconstruction of the coral reefs. A problem is the mass tourism at the coral reefs. Even though we already established rules concerning this problem, we still have to work on ways to protect the reefs. To prevent phenomena like coral bleaching, we also have to think about the salination and acidification of the ocean. The water conditions should be undisturbed, which means that there should not be a change of chemical parameters like salt content and the pH. Furthermore, we discussed the problem in the fishing industry with our classmates and we came to the conclusion that there have to be stricter rules for fishing and more inspections of fishing companies and aqua farming companies to prevent overfishing and mistreatment of animals. Particularly, fishing with trawl nets not only impairs the marine animals but also the sea floor. Therefore, we have to find alternative ways for fishing. Finally, we think that politics should invest more in the protection of our environment and advocate stronger actions against the climate change. As a young generation, we wish to find and implement solutions for these issues. In the past, we already talked about these possible solutions, but still to this day, we haven't done enough to save our oceans. To provide a healthy ecosystem for the next generations, this topic has to be a way bigger part in our everyday life as well as in politics. All in all, we still have a long way to go, but we are certain that we still have a chance to save our environment, especially the ocean. And that was the input from the younger generation, very serious, uh, but uh, very important, of course, Sophie and Annelie from uh, Kippenberg Senior School in Bremen, and they will join the discussion later on as well. And as you can see already, our next speaker is here in the studio with me in Berlin. Let me briefly introduce her to you as well, because she's a visual and performing artist, CEO of the marine protection organization Deep Wave. Her name is Anna Mandel. She performed both on stage and in films in her artistic work, and you will see this now as well. She uses means of sculpture, painting and drawing, installation and performance to explore the impact of human beings on the world in which, quote, we are guests. Anna Mandel, so good to have you with us. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, when I was asked as an artist about to speak here about my vision of a healthy and resilient ocean, I was asking me what it means, health and resilience. Health is about thriving. Uh, yes, sorry. Health is about thriving and abundance and being congruent with oneself. And these are illustrations which are made for the Ocean Primer for the German NGO Deep Wave. Resilience, I know it from the context of grief. When you have lost someone who deeply belongs to you, and now we need the second <laughs> part. OK, yeah, so <laughs> resilience. I know from the context of grief, when you've lost someone who deeply belongs to you, then your survival depends on your capacity for resilience. And that means the ability to rebuild your world from scratch. With the Ocean Primer, we give children some ideas on how to do this. But the most important point for me is that we are not protecting the oceans for our own benefits, but solely because 
of their intrinsic value. Maybe this shift is clear to us as a thought, but not to our feelings. As an illustrator, I can work with this. Here, for example, it's about our oceans starting on land. And an adult immediately has the association with the lungs. The rivers are for the planet what our blood vessels are to our lungs. As I traced each coastline in the middle of the night using only the light from the light table, a very strong feeling of connectedness suddenly set in. Right here on this coastline where my pencil is, people live, sleep, eat, love, argue, sit with their children listening to the ocean swell. And we as artists are committed to show this feeling of connectedness. So I would like to share some works of colleagues that inspired me. They all make us pause and feel differently. Guardian, a short film by David Dinser, is about the symbiosis between an obviously formerly living helmet diver and a coral. The coral gives him breath and he protects her. And the voice of the coral leaves us with a sentence, I can live as long as you let me. And by the way, this is not animated. It's all really filmed underwater with a real helmet diver. from Arma, a film on the, of the famous Abnur diver Julie Gauthier dancing underwater. The story behind is about a heavy loss. But for all of us which, who know it by heart, these images are of strongest resilience. When we watch Julie Gauthier dance underwater without breathing, it feels like coming home. And that's weird. Only the breath reminds us of our finiteness. And finally, a short glimpse of our ongoing project, an animated short film with our ambassador, the actor Frederick Goetz. We aim to find one image for this weird, beautiful connectedness. If we trace this feeling, then we will know what to do. And if it goes even better, then we will do it. Well, thank you so much, Anna Mandel. Uh, very moving uh, presentation, images, music, sound, thoughts. Uh, so. Uh, that has to sink in, but uh, you still have to pay attention because we have three more presentations uh, uh, equally interesting and moving in their own right. The next one from uh, Britta Knefelkamp. Uh, she is a marine biologist and since 2020 she also heads the Department Marine Nature Conservation at the German Federal Agency for Nature Conservation. And Britta is on standby, ready to go. Britta, we're all ears. Yeah, thank you very much, Monika. Yeah, I was asked to share my vision of a healthy and resilient ocean with you, and I'm very happy for this chance. The previous visions were already very impressive and motivating to me. Well, I don't have such nice pictures for you and just me and my words. So I can hope, I hope that you can follow me. My vision of a healthy ocean is prospering life different and diverse species and habitats, larger and smaller species, thicker and thinner ones, colorful and colorless, sandy, muddy and stony underground covered with algae, perforated by worms, 
troubled by feeders. My vision of a healthy ocean is an ocean without harmful substances, with no waste, no harmful underwater noise, no useless killing of species, and no useless and unrecoverable destroying of habitats. My vision is high biodiversity, where natural conditions allow it, a place with nature in balance, where natural ups and downs occur with heterogeneity, with natural gains and losses. An ocean with ecosystems that can be used by humans as an everlasting food source, an additional energy source, an additional transportation route. My vision of a healthy ocean, and this is the best thing on my vision, I think, was once true. It was reality before we exaggerated its using of nature. I guess 200 years ago, no one was even able to imagine that the ocean in every aspect, vast and overwhelming, can be destroyed like it is today. And that is why my vision, my hope is that mankind understands that it is unavoidable to find the way in the middle, this one shade of gray that allows nature to be nature and that allows mankind to use it. In my opinion, there are four necessities for this. We need areas of strict nature protection. We need a dominant role of nature protection and nature-based solutions in economic use, for example, in shipping, fishing, mining, energy production, fertilization on land, and also waste management. Furthermore, we need more knowledge about the oceans and last but not least, we need public awareness and request for protection of marine life. And with this, I hope that the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development is able to raise this awareness and knowledge of the fragile and wonderful marine ecosystems of our world, of their species and habitats, and helps finding solutions in realizing my vision and maybe also your vision of a healthy and resilient ocean. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Britta, for painting this uh, beautiful picture with words on your vision of a healthy ocean. Moving on to Christine Burmeister. Now she says about herself, I am one of those people who were caught by the fascination of the ocean since they were a child. Uh, not surprisingly, she learned scuba diving early on to explore the ocean on her own. And today, uh, Christine is a uh, postdoctoral researcher in physical oceanography at the Scottish Association for Marine Science, focusing her research on the entire Atlantic. Uh, Kristen, it's very good to have you with us, and we look forward to your vision of a healthy ocean. Thank you so much. So um, today I'm going to share my vision of, the, um, of a healthy ocean from a physical kind of view. So I'm wearing my uh, physics classes and um, I hope I can explain uh, my vision uh, to you now. So the first thing that comes into my mind when thinking about ocean health is stationarity. The ocean is constantly moving and changing. When all these natural changes move around a stationary uh, background state, then an ecosystem can thrive. When now this background state is not stationary anymore, but for example, increases like the temperature does at the moment, ecosystems are getting closer to the maximum temperature boundary they can cope with. An extreme event, event like a marine heat wave might now push the ecosystem beyond this coping range with severe consequences. Due to climate change, we move from a stationary background state to a changing one. 90% of the excess heat the Earth gained due to climate change is absorbed by the ocean. This heat is pumped into the deep ocean by the meridional overturning circulation that is a big global circulation connecting all basins with each other from north to south, from the surface to the bottom. 
In the overturning circulation, water sinks to the deep and rises to the surface, like in a big conveyor belt. The sinking and rising of water is driven by changes in density, which is basically changes in temperature and salinity. In the Atlantic, the meridional overturning circulation carries around 20 million cubic meters of water per second, which is approximately 100 times the discharge of the Amazon River. And it transports 1.23 petawatts of heat. So what does this mean? It's 50 times the global human energy consumption per year. So it's a massive heat transport that this current is doing. One circuit within the meridional overturning circulation takes around a thousand years. With global warming, we now pump a large amount of heat into the deep ocean, and that for a very, very long time. As the circulation is driven by changes in temperature, climate change also affects this big circulation, which again causes changes to our climate system. With this knowledge of the changing background state, I feel that simply saying a stationary ocean is a healthy ocean is too simple and no one of us will live long enough to experience it. So my healthy ocean is an ocean that is heated less and less until the heat stops eventually. It is an ocean where changes are so slow that ecosystem can adapt, which they have to. It is an ocean providing resources to humans and humans will only take so much that the ecosystem remains healthy and protect those area in the ocean where the pressure due to the rising temperature and changing climate is already too high. To do that, we need to monitor the ocean closely, the big circulations, but also the local ecosystems. It will be a huge effort to get there and it will take a very long time. This is why with every day that passes, it's getting more and more important to stop climate change and protect the oceans. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your vision of a healthy ocean and certainly that very close connection to fighting climate change there with us. We have one more uh, presentation uh, from Alicia Mateos Cardenas. Uh, she works as a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Biological Earth and Environmental Sciences from Cork University College in Ireland. Uh, her current main project is looking at the abundance of microplastics and their associated chemicals in Irish deep sea coral habitats. Uh, Alicia, very good to have you with us again and uh, your vision of a healthy ocean, please. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes, so um, I am Alicia. Like you said, I'm coming from Ireland, but I'm actually Spanish. Um, um, so I actually come from a city that is um, from the mainland in Spain. Um, so my very first connection with the ocean actually comes from like holidays with my family. So from a recreation perspective. Uh, so for me, first of all, from a personal view, my view of a healthy ocean is an ocean in which we can all go, uh, you know, on our holidays or days um, and enjoy, obviously not finding any rubbish in it. So my um, all my experience has been uh, done on plastic pollution, like um, like I said. So my perspective that I'm going to be presenting today actually comes from plastics. Um, I want to say uh, that um, you know we all know that plastics are polluting all the environments and including the ocean, but um, the ocean is not the problem. Actually, the ocean is a symptom of a major global problem, um, which is everywhere, and. The main reason uh, the plastics are a problem is our throwaway society and single-use products. Um, so the main sources of plastic pollution in the ocean are uh, terrestrial, actually. So from our cities, uh, like the urban environment, like I said, single-use plastics, but also our own clothes, which are made of um, like polymers that are plastic, such as polyester. Um, so what can we do to um, achieve a healthy ocean, which for me must be a clean ocean? Um, for, from our perspective of uh, individuals, but also consumers, we can uh, make better choices when we buy um, stuff, anything. But it's very important that 
the pressure is not put on us only. Uh, it's very important that we actually put the pressure in governments and big, big corporations, which are the ones that can actually make a change. Um, and in the last eight years of my um, career in plastic pollution, I have actually seen this positive change despite um, you know, all the negative news about everything being so polluted from the deep ocean, which is where I work currently, to the top of the tallest mountains. Um, so very important that we believe that we can um, have this power. And I, I think that we are going to talk about this later in the next session. Um, but um, to finish with a positive, um, some positive news from recently, you probably know that last week um, in Nairobi, the United Nations, agreed um, massively on a plastic treaty. So in the next two years, we're probably going to see positive movements um, towards a cleaner ocean as well, free from plastics in the future, hopefully, and also free from other um, chemical pollutants as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. And it's uh, uh, so kind of you to, to end on a happy note that uh, when it comes to your vision of a healthy ocean, namely with less plastic as well, we already uh, have done a major step forward there. So thank you. And thank you to all the other uh, uh, speakers here sharing their vision with us. It's uh, now time for some questions, I'm sure. Tim is already standing by for some questions. And if you have any uh, or comments, then you're more than welcome to submit them in the chat. So one of us has a chance to pass them on. But uh, first, it's over to you, Tim. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, that was an exciting set of um views, uh, visions of on a healthy ocean, uh, to some extent very emotional, very touching. And I think the most emotional, most touching was the one that you gave, Anna. And uh, as a coach, I had the privilege to see your um, presentation in advance. I've already seen it two or three times and it's uh, so emotional. It's, it's fantastic to see. You, you really have a strong environmentalist heart. That's very obvious. But you're not a scientist, um, but you're forwarding these ocean themes and you're doing it as an artist. Um, uh, how, we all want to get people engaged to, to, to believe in ocean, ocean health, to do something, and uh, we have different approaches. So um, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to get people involved, to get people engaged? That we don't feel ourselves. It seems perhaps a, a strange answer, but um, if I don't feel myself, I cannot advocate for something with empathy. And um, there's also a second part of the obstacle that we can't feel our future. I can feel the pain I have, I'm in now, but I can't feel the pain I, pain I will have. And so we don't act for our future and for the future for the oceans. Yes, that's um, something we have to digest and, and we have to do something about it. And uh, there are others also, I think, uh, who have strong opinions. I was also thrilled by the presentation of, uh, uh, of Annelie and Sophie. And it's not Annelie and Sophie only. Thank you for being with us, for participating. And also thank you to your teacher, Katharina Basch, who uh, made this possible. And I know it's, uh, it's not only the two of you that are doing it. We also, you're also just representing a larger group. Can we also see the larger group? Are they around? And can, we, can, can you give, yeah? Have a wave with us. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to see that you all contributed. Sophie and Anneli are your spokespersons. It's good, um, but it's, uh, it's an effort of, of, of all of you. And uh, you are very young. You could do lots of things. Why are you so engaged for the ocean? Um, well, because we are most affected by all the problems. Um, and we think that the adults don't necessarily do enough to save our oceans. We will live long enough to peel up the consequences and then there won't be any time left to um, solve these problems. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to tell the, old, uh, the older generation? What do you wish for them to do? Um, we wish for more information and education for the public. Scientific findings have to be more communicated. Even, even the, um, like the conference we have yet, 
can be in the TV. And we also think that the older generation should use all capacities, like, for example, money, um, to take action, because we're too young to do that. So <laughs> we need the help of the older generation to use those capacities and to take action. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for all of that emotion, in my view, actually. And um, uh, I know you, Britta, for a long time, and I also know that you have an extremely challenging job um, yeah, in the German cons nature conservation arena. And I just would like to ask you a question with regard to what you think the greatest uh, challenges um, when it comes to um, political sort of changes um, in yeah trying to do something for the rain, uh, the ocean. What what would you suggest um, in the political arena we might have to do um, in future to a greater degree? Yeah, thank you very much, Karen. Um, well, we have to do so much more. Um, that is maybe an easy answer, but there's so much behind. Um, it's so difficult uh, to to get really larger steps forward because in the political arena, we always have to to engage all stakeholders, all the people, all the the economists and that have special interests on the marine environment and get their agreement for, uh, for example, nature conservation uh, areas or management plans. And that's why we can't really go forward as uh, we, we would like to. And um, that is challenge challenging every day, really. And um, also, I think we already mentioned uh, energy and uh, climate change. And that is also a maybe problem for us in the marine environment to uh, somehow combine the tackling of climate change and biodiversity loss. And that is uh, really hard to do so big challenge and uh, it involves engaging um, citizens to a, a very large degree as in, in the way we think um, and I know that's how you see it as well and with that I actually that would lead on to my next question um, to you Christine um, because you know, you you sort of are a kind of a physicist. You see it from a global point of view. Um, what actually do you think we could do as an individual? Do you see individual contributions to actually, yeah, help, yeah, move us forward and maybe move a little bit towards what Britta's saying, um, a larger, uh, yeah, dialogue maybe on the political arena. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you. So um, it's, of course, difficult to see how my individual contribution um, can actually contribute to such a global issue. But um, I think um, we need to act now. And any change, even if it's so little, can uh, give the momentum that drives actually bigger changes. Of course, we need... Um, the governments to act on it. But also we as individuals, I think we can contribute. And this can be so different for someone. It might be just like picking up a bit of plastic, which might help. For others, when they fight for qualities um, or try to uh, fight um, the gender bias or so, that might move us um, to a more sustainable land, uh, lifestyle. Or um, just uh, for others, it's like taking the bike instead of the car. I mean, all these little changes can have an impact in the end um, if everybody is doing it, because we are so many. I mean, the individual action are also what is causing, for example, um, the ocean health pro things uh, issue, um, because um, they add up uh, to big change. And so I, I believe that also the individual contribution um, can help in order to put it back to health, um, even though we, of course, need the governments to act on a more global space as well. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, it's, it seems that the, the longer we, we are continuing here, we think ocean health is really a, a, an exciting, a very popular thing. And um, what you are doing, Alicia, is also a kind of very popular now. You're working on plastics, microplastics. Um, and we hear a lot about it, not only in, in scientific publications, but even everywhere in the public it is reported about. And people are having all these kind of uh, activities towards ocean cleanups. But I'm asking myself, is this really this, the solution? So what is your opinion as a specialist, as an expert in this? Um, can ocean cleanups be uh, the solution or part of the solution? Um, that's a very good question, and to be honest, um, I don't want to be too negative about it because the first thing I did even before uh, being a professional in plastic pollution was to just clean up the beaches because that's what we all can do. And in fact, it's a very powerful tool for us to see the pollution, um, whereas, you know, for example, we cannot see emissions to climate change. Uh, but so it's a very powerful tool. Um, so from Environmental education purposes is great, and there is loads of, you know, uh, projects going on which are good. In fact, also some of them sometimes can also be linked to citizen science projects. Um, I'm, I am involved in some of those. So by giving, you know, scientific methodologies and tools to citizen scientists, which can be, uh, you know, a family going to collect some plastics or an NGO going to collect some plastics to the beach, you can actually use the data and move forward with that. Um, uh, but obviously we need to bear in mind that it's not the solution uh, to plastic pollution. The solution must come from, from the source. Like we, we need to stop it at the source. And that's why I was saying us as consumers can do our bit literally every day every day we buy something, but also very importantly, we can also put pressure on governments um, if we can, uh, because they actually hear to us sometimes, or uh, big corporations, because corporations just want to sell stuff. And I'm not into consumerism or capitalism, but it's true that we, we've seen these changes recently as well. Like if big companies see that at least some of us are into sustainability, they are gonna be bringing alternatives it's also interesting, you know, some alternatives might not be as green as we expect them to be. Um, but yeah, so it's good to do ocean cleanups, but we, mu we must, you know, remember that the, the solution must be at the source. Yeah, thank you. That's a um, very good statement. Maybe can I can add something to this perspective. Be colle colleagues of mine did a modeling study and uh, found out um, that if you use 200 of these devices, you would need 130 years just to remove 5% of uh, the plastic from the ocean. So it's quite obvious what you said is much more important. Um, we need to start looking at the problem at the source. And it has a lot of to do with, I think, with our emotions, what we can feel, and which brings me back to, to Anna. Um, what other means do we have to, to, make, people, to make things that unfelt to make them felt and that they lead to some action. How would you do this? Because we are talking about the oceans, I would say the first step on the path to do something is to go to the ocean and sit there and breathe and feel being that we are everything. It's very simple, but... <laughs> Actually, I, I totally agree. I think what you said earlier on and actually what we said in the previous um, panel um, is that if you can't see it, you don't think there's a problem, right? Um, and if you can't feel it, you might not actually be able to act. That's what you have said very yes. clearly. And um, I, I just like to throw that at our, our panelists, at, to all of you. How can we get um, scientists and um, everyone together to actually um, join the, emo the feeling part with the science part. This is a really, this is the, the thing that young people do really well, by the way, you two ladies there in the school. Um, you still, you know, there's a saying um, which is, you see well with your heart. 
you young people see, see well with your heart, and we scientists have to make sure that we see well with our heart, but we take steps which are neutral and which are clear cut, right? So we have to stop our heart there. So people like you, Anna, in my view, are the ones to join um, the emotional side, the younger side, and also the scientists. Um, and maybe we will move uh, forward a bit better like that. And I'd just like to throw that into the fray for general discussion. I think you've all sort of said it. So who'd like to take the lead? With the ladies, the two young ladies who feel with their hearts maybe like to take the re lead. Please do. Well, um, I feel like you just have to find the right balance of following your heart and also um, following neutral ways and following science. And therefore, it's also important for the younger generation and the older generation to, to work together so we can all together find solutions for these problems. Anyone else? Britta, maybe you from your very, very long um, yeah, career on different areas. How do you see it? I'm sorry, I just have my crying daughter next to me. <laughs> So I didn't get the question. Can you question. shortly repeat it? I'm sorry for that. The question is, how do you get the more measuring, less emotional part of the observational world, in other words, scientists, um, to work together with the, those who are actually troubled by what is going on in the environment so that we get better observation systems, better management systems, um, do we need people like Anna, for example, to help us there? Yeah, definitely. We we somehow need to get into into communication. We need to go into the public, the people who who are working with the oceans, as also Sophie and Anneli, I, I think, already said. We need publications. We need somehow a, a communication way between all people to somehow network in a larger scale and to go forward all together. I'm sorry for, to say no, for the background sorry. noise. It's okay. That's, that's the next generation. So they, they need to be taken along. So thank you for having her there, actually. It's very important uh -huh. to all of us. Yeah, I, I'm just coming back to you, Christine. It must be a tough time for you, a physical oceanographer. I think nobody would think about ocean health and talking about physical oceanography. But why is it also such an important component uh, of ocean health to take care of ocean circulation, about, of physical oceanography? Yeah, this is um, quite abstract, I think. It's not as obvious as um, plastic or um, a dye coral, uh, I fear. But I think the physics actually are providing us um, with the basic you need. Uh, for example, um, in physics, we are um, measuring uh, temperature, obviously, when it is too hot. Um, you have a problem and you might not uh, want to live in too hot. You might die if it's too hot as a marine uh, animal, for example, or migrate away. But also uh, ocean currents are quite important. They are um, transporting things like heat, but also oxygen, for example. And um, if um, ocean currents are changing, some changes um, um, might affect the oxygen um, content in the ocean, which causes also stress as a, uh, for ecosystems. So um, all these physics, they are setting the background state um, the ecosystem are living in. And then, of course, that can also affect us, because um, if the fish migrate away from areas where we fish and where we get our food, then um, the people that um, are depending on this uh, source um, have a problem, right? Because uh, they cannot fish anymore in their own borders, but need to look for fish elsewhere. So um, this is where the um, physics um, is tying in here. Uh, just a, a very concrete example after um, what, what do we expect when, when the, uh, the Gulf Stream would be shut down? It's one of the major currents. What happens? Uh, 
Uh, the Gulf Stream is one part of this big ocean circulation that I was talking about, and it is transporting um, a lot of feed um, actually through the Atlantic from the south uh, towards the north. And when this is now um, shutting down, we have, um, which it's not happening so fast, changes won't happen so fast on the climate system. But anyway, when the Gulf Stream is uh, slowing down, less heat is transported into the um, North Atlantic, into the Nordic Sea. And this actually may impact the weather, in particular in Europe, because um, Europe is quite warm when we compare it to our neighboring um, continents like Siberia or Canada. And um, we would, um, so it's difficult to predict what actually happened, but um, our weather system or our climate here in Europe um, would change. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, I, I'm actually when you know I work with long-term data sets myself, so I actually see the North Sea warming sort of like in the last hundred years very clearly. Um, so I can actually visualize it. I'm back to this visualizing thing. And when we see that our uh, we have a few questions from the chat. Um, which is about the really visual pollution. Nobody's asking us much questions, actually, many questions on um, noise. They're not asking us questions on, uh, yeah, eutrophication, i.e. nutrients and stuff, but everybody seems to be still really worried about the plastics. And we have two questions here, which are, do we have to actually take on um, the big companies that do not um, really give us good consumer advice about our plastics. This is the one thing. Now, should we be actually actively trying to um, enhance policy against companies that, yeah, sort of sell us the wrong stuff, if I may put it like that? And then the other one is, um, yeah, what is is our biodegradable plastics useful? Um, in other words, the stuff that we, the ideas that we have out there, and which consumers believe might help. Um, or are they just as problematic and are they examples of greenwashing? This has all got to do with our consumption of plastics. Maybe, Alicia, you can just take on these questions and, and try to give us a view on them. Um, yeah, um, actually both questions come, uh, you know, I can, I can answer them together. Um, it's true, um, to be honest, there are some, there are many products that are in the market, which are not only made of like a plastic, but they also have additives, which are chemicals in general. And um, companies won't tell us, even as scientists, if we want to like make, do research on them, they won't tell us what, they, what kind of additives they've added to them. Um, so it's very hard to get that information. Obviously they, they save it because um, that's how they make their product. They are not going to tell you the secret recipe. Um, and the same is happening actually with bioplastics. So like I said, you know, throughout the last years of working in plastics, I've seen good changes from, from companies. Um, at least, you know, it made me, at some point, it made me think that they were listening to us. Uh, but then you, then you realize that, you know, uh, they are just, making new products that in this case they are called bioplastics because they are made of plants for example uh, not of fossil fuels so in a way it's good because we won't be depending on fossil fuels to make um, plastics in this case uh, and they are seen as an alternative but the problem is that yeah they are also a synthetic polymer made um, to mimic what a plastic uh, like a fossil fuel plastic was doing so we can find in, you know, in the environment, bioplastics. So for example, like coffee lids are made of plant-based uh, plastic PLA. You can see it in the label. You will be able to find those because they, they are so synthetic and made to last as well, even though they are single use, that they won't actually degrade in the environment. They only degrade under industrial compost compostable um, situations. So, uh, the question also of greenwashing, uh, yes, there is lots of greenwashing. And in a way, like I see companies moving towards sustainable solutions, but choosing the grown alternatives. Um, I don't know if they know that they are not making the right choices. They're going for what they can. 
uh, but it's true. Um, and obviously, once I've seen this, once a company is making the effort, and actually they put lots of money uh, to change to what they think is a better alternative, they are going to be showing off and then putting loads of ads about it because they want to prove that they are more green. And sometimes this is leading into greenwashing. So it's very important that we kind of like take bioplastics from still a precocious perspective. Um, and just to finish with this, to be honest, from what I've seen in the lab and in other, uh, from, from other research, pure bioplastic products can be as bad as pure fossil-based products. Um, so we, at the moment, there is not much information. We will probably know more in the future when more research is done on this and what's the best alternative in the end. Gosh. It's complicated. Uh, it is. But <laughs> Anneli and Sophie, you also mentioned it in your presentation. I mean, it was a very all-encompassing global statement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but how aware are you of that? And what are you doing yourself and, and all of you in your group, maybe? Um, so, well, for example, I, and I think we both didn't know that bioplastic also has its negative aspects. So I feel like um, information like this should also be shared more publicly. So we all know that. So like, I don't think you would, when you see bioplastic, you just think, oh yeah, that's good. I, I'm going to buy that instead of actual plastic. So it, it would be amazing if we all would get this information like, for example, if it would be shared in news on TV mm -hmm. and things like that. And um, I think both of us are always trying, like, for example, when going to a supermarket to not buy things that are just um, the least expensive. And instead, we try to find alternative things that we can buy that are um, maybe better for the environment and, for example, stuff that is not all wrapped in 10 layers of plastic. Congratulations. That's a fantastic point that you make. And isn't this the point where you come in, Anna, with art? Why? <laughs> in order to transport this information, plastic is so obvious and, and still we do not have a solution. Can arts help to spreading the word to any kind of solutions? Yeah, I'm, I'm with this um, spreading of information because I, this is really a, a huge point that you both made because um, I'm thinking a lot how to be in a bubble. In my bubble, we knew that uh, bioplastics are bullshit, but uh, it's, I think it's a, the task is to spread it. And I'm, I don't know if, if an artist, how an artist can... I think the most that I can do as an artist is to to give this idea that I have to reflect every move, every movement I do, and, but not to be paralyzed by this or by, by grief. This is perhaps this can I say, instead of, of being paralyzed by grief and guilt because it's overwhelming, an overwhelming problem, acting can enable us to see this transformation had as an opportunity. And this I can, we artists can do. I can really uh, empathize with that, actually. Um, when we hold climate lectures, for example, in public, which we scientists do, uh, the question is always uh, arises from the public is, what can we do here? We are so um, impassioned about this subject, but de facto, we are too small uh, in the whole thing and we can't see straight anymore. And I think uh, that's where it takes me back to um, people like, uh, uh, yeah, you girls um, and Britta, also you, people who in influence policy uh, on how to make policy a more digestible, um, more civilian and more normal person uh, yeah, implementable, kind of like, you know, everybody can drive a car. I mean, let's face it, um, because the rules are quite simple. Um, and when it comes to the environment, we do need a new way of looking at the rules. Why not? Why don't you do it? Now, everybody can play games by the rules. We're, we're really good at that. 
And I think, um, and maybe, Britta, you could comment upon this too. Um, it's, it's on the one hand showing the issue and not losing yourself in detail, right? And then the other end, set, setting up a series of clear rules and information, which um, yeah, make, us, make it easier for us to take first steps, even though there might be baby steps. And, and Britta, maybe you could come in on this, because you know a lot yeah. about these things. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, the the biggest problem is that not all people think like this. Uh, there are too many people that just want who just wants uh, economic uh, profits. And um, in politics, we always have to find an agreement somehow. And uh, economical stakeholders uh, like the fishing industries, they have a really huge lobby in the public and uh, then nature protection doesn't have such a great lobby because you can't earn money with it so to say with economics you can earn money and uh, you have a lobby group behind you but uh, for nature conservation it's uh, really hard to to get that loud and to get that large and to to force policies into the right direction in our sense. So we need to stand up like Fridays for Future. They were very successful. They reached politics and we need to do this for nature protection as well somehow. Yeah, thank you for that good suggestion. Actually, we have an interesting question in the chat, which is, they want to point out to us, and they're absolutely right, that it is absolutely not just plastic and it's not just warming, um, that it's really an encompassing problem, um, the issues that we're facing with the ocean. And it's not just about fisheries or whatever. Um, they, for example, describe the declining oxygen in the ocean as um, one of the issues that we have. And yes, this is an issue. And to answer the question, um, we cannot ignore it. Um, and we certainly can't ignore it, um, for example, in the Baltic Sea. It's an example where we really have a, 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 an oxygen issue. And in the tropics, we have many oxygen issues. And it often has to do with um, too many nutrients, which again are very related to policy. And if I may give you a good example, in the North Sea, we turned off the nutrients in the late 70s because we used sewage treatment plants. And we ended up with a nice clean, um, oh, yeah, nutriently clean ocean, but it's still warming really fast. So, yeah, I mean, there's yeah, lots of issues out there that we have to sort out. And that actually is the hardest thing, is trying to differentiate the different issues, trying to come up with you know, ways of solving them as scientists, as a concert with all the different players. Yeah. So that other comment, Anna, it's kind of for you. Look, we need head knowledge, heart motivation, and hands action to tackle these issues. So I guess the heart motivation is the bit that you brought to this group. Um, and it's not just you alone as an artist who can do that. It's that sentence. We need head knowledge, which is, I suppose, us really, isn't it, in a way? Yes. Heart action and motivation, which is you young ladies down there, don't lose it. Yeah, and hands on action, which is everybody cleaning up the beaches if it takes it, um, really, at the end. So thank you for that comment out of the public. Right, do, we, do any of you have any other things you need to say? Would you like to, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, late in the afternoon. <laughs> Anybody have something they want to bring in? Monica wants to say something, <laughs> and she, we, have to, we have to let her jump in here. Oh. That's okay, Monica? Well, you just opened my mic. That would be helpful. Is my mic open? Okay. I just wanted to jump in because I was, uh, uh, well, I didn't want to barge in and disturb anything, but uh, that question uh, from Sophie and Annalie about, you know, why, why don't we know about certain things? 
I'm intrigued by that question in particular because I happen to work for the media and I happen to know that uh, there is an awful lot of output there. Yeah, But I think it is, you can't see the wood for the trees anymore. So uh, my question, I have a, a question for you two in particular. When you say about the information, for example, about what kind of plastic, uh, is there any kind of good plastic or what should we buy, what should we not buy, what is really helpful? Where actually are you trying to find the information? Are you looking like into specific magazines? Um, or what would be more helpful? Because I know the information is out there, but I also know it is really, really hard to find it. So, Sophie and Anneli. Um, yes, it's hard to find for us um, that information we need. Um, we look in the internet on on the newspapers maybe or on the social media platforms but there's so much information so we can't see the the real information and that information we need so maybe into the round uh, 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 Britta or Alicia uh, is it feasible uh, from the science community perspective uh, to introduce something like uh, a button you know like there is the, in Germany we have this scheme uh, when you buy something that is ecologically friendly or uh, whether uh, supply chains are uh, absolutely uh, spot on and everybody along the supply chain actually earns the amount of money that they deserve. Is something like that feasible uh, for products? Because, I mean, plastic, uh, you know, when you just buy something like washing detergent, uh, you usually grab uh, one of those buckets and it says biodegradable plastic. But is that better? Is it not better? C could, could you think of something that is visible when you go into a shop rather than having to study theses beforehand, something that is immediately visible. Is, is that possible from the science community to talk to policymakers, to industry, to say only those with that button, blue, red, whatever color, um, actually says something about how ecologically friendly this product is or isn't? For the ocean. For the ocean. Um, yeah, um, this is something, so we also need to understand that, you know, in this case, bioplastics are so new, literally only a couple of years uh, they've been in the markets, uh, widely, I mean. So uh, changes have been made very fast and that's why things have might been introduced without you know, proper testing. So I know that, it, yeah, we as scientists have been putting um, you know, emphasis on this to industries and policymakers. Um, I know that from the European Commission, they are moving towards, um, you know, understanding how bioplastics can be produced uh, in a better way. So, for example, a label in the future could be like, for example, with fair trade or or organic. But then we also need to be cautious because sometimes some labels can not be, um, you know, can be misleading. But I'd like to also finish by saying that. Um, while those changes are being made, uh, hopefully in the good way, we also um, should know that, you know, plastics, bioplastics or normal plastics are not a problem as a material, just a material. And to be honest, it was uh, probably the best material that was uh, produced in our society in terms of, you know, for medicine, for building, they actually helped. The problem is the single use products, which can be bioplastics as well. So it's not really so much the material, but it's how we use them as a society. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we also be fo we should be focusing on. So like the girls were saying, you know, they try to try to buy better alternatives. For example, by actually just reducing them, just no no buying something that is wrapped in ten layers of plastic, or um, just buying products that are actually like plastic free in the first place. Mm -hmm. Can, 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 that will be ideal. I think that's also a clear call for better communication between science and society. Mm. And that's what we, the call is there for a decade or so, and, and we're still struggling to do it, um, not only because of the missing competence, also because of the missing resources that we have. But it's quite clear to what many of you said, we need a better communication between science and society, which means all stakeholder groups, not just uh, an intensified dialogue with policymakers, but with all 
parts of society. And I always see it as a, a, a brilliant example. It has been mentioned before. Fridays for Future is uh, a youth um, movement of well-informed youngsters um, who became a political power. Mm. However, I think the media need to play a better role as well. Absolutely. They need to translate what we say the way we say it to the society. Well, that's a good point translate what the scientists say, the way they say it, but that laymen understand it. That is a big challenge. Uh, and we take that challenge on. Uh, of course, I can not speak on behalf of the entire media, but certainly for my own role in it. Um, but I think with the Ocean Decade Laboratories, we already have a really good tool, certainly for all those who register, who join us, uh, to engage and to exchange views and learn from one another. And with keeping an eye on the clock, I would like to wrap this session uh, and thank all the speakers who participated. Uh, of course, thank Karen and Tim uh, and Anna, who is uh, no longer visible because we're in the studio <laughs> and someone limited with space. Uh, but so thank you so much. We take another short break, 10 minutes. Uh, you can check out what the satellite activities are actually offering. You can have your cup of tea. You can register to be part of the expert roster. Whatever you do, make sure to be back in 10 minutes from now. Bye. very resilient, but we have taken it for granted for too long. If we don't change our behavior now, we will experience tipping point events that may change life on Earth as we know it. The ocean health is important because the ocean is a home for billions of species. A resilient and healthy ocean is important because the ocean underpins our lives, cultures, and livelihoods. I don't think humans are enough concerned about ocean health because there are still cases where people and culturally destroy the marine environment and fresh men discard the pollution. A healthy ocean for me is not just one without pollution. It's also a highly productive system, abundant with biotic and abiotic resources. I don't think people care enough about ocean health, the deterioration of the ocean environment, and the disappearance of species, so that the health of the ocean is not taken seriously. I don't think the oceans are healthy now, because the fish resources that we enjoyed in our childhood are not available now. I think ocean resilience is important because ocean is the home where human beings live and it has some problems such as pollution we need to solve together.
and by now present oceans are getting more and more unhealthy because uh, of and getting saturated with the atmospheric gases like carbon dioxide that is um, mostly because of the anthropogenic activities i think the sea where i live is healthy because my mom agreed with me to swim in it and there are a lot of delicious seafood is a wonderful creation distracted by another wonderful creation human beings both are at risk so save ocean save life i think ocean resilience is important and that's why people can still get enough seafood after high intensive fishing leaving shellfish in the works only a diverse ocean can be a healthy ocean because biodiversity is the insurance the oceans need to cope with environmental change human made or natural so the study and discovery of the unknown marine biodiversity is key to ocean stewardship. I don't think humans are paying enough attention to the ocean health. Human activities are destroying the ocean health, such as overfishing and poor culture, also engineering and land based pollution. The ocean is that provide us with many ecosystem services, including biodiversity, killing water, tourism, carbon storage, and sea food. I do think uh, humans are enough concerned about the ocean health because they are increasingly care about uh, their own health. Only in a healthy and resilient ocean can mollusks grow up to be healthy big shells like these ones. We don't think humans are enough concerned about ocean health. Marine animals are being hunted in large numbers. Lots of garbage floating in the ocean. People's awareness of environmental protection needs to be strengthened. In my opinion, saving ocean is the right of each and every life on Earth. As we all depend on ocean, which is the wellspring of innumerable resources. During dive sessions, I've experienced a healthy ocean before. And to make sure it stays that way, not only benefits our planet and biodiversity, but also allows others to experience its beauty. To me, a healthy ocean is one that we don't treat as a dump, into which we mindlessly give all of our excess nutrients, our gases and our toxic wastes. We need to become aware of what the ocean does for us and meet it with the appropriate respect. Well, I think the ocean in 2030 will look different from today's, but it will still contain abundant life, have colorful fish and coral reefs, beautiful beaches, many migratory birds in the modern sea, large whales in all ocean regions, and above all, people who have learned and are more responsible with the ocean. We believe that the ocean is unhealthy. Recently, the ocean pollution has become increasingly serious such as red tide corrosion and other problems. This leads to the reduction of the marine biodiversity. To ensure that our oceans continue to provide benefits to current and future generations, it is urgent to increase efforts to restore our ocean health. For the health of our oceans. We are moving! My vision of a healthy ocean is that the ocean free from pollution, the water is clean and clear. So a healthy ocean for me should function well, uh, be free from pollutions, should be able to support many different marine creatures. For me, achieving a healthy and resilient ocean in the Southern Ocean is really important. Not only because it is home to unique and iconic biodiversity, but also because it plays a disproportionate role in regulating global climate. A healthy ocean would be synonymous with a clean or rather sustainable habitat that would continue to support all life without getting perished itself. The ocean health is closely related to human health. So for that reason, we need to pay more attention to the multiple stressors that we humans are imposing on the ocean. Things like ocean warming, ocean acidification, overfishing or pollution. Not only for the ocean's sake, but for our own. I think the ocean where I live is healthy because we can still feel our spirit. The spirit of our first mother, the earth. Water is life for all things. Without the spirit of water, we have nothing. Not only do we need her, 
but she needs all of us. Welcome back. Uh, still good to go, I hope, because we have uh, a third and final uh, session for you uh, with great speakers. So I hope uh, you had your cup of tea, your cup of coffee, uh, and are fit and full of energy for this particular session, which asks the question, what can we do to achieve a healthy and resilient ocean initiatives from around the world? What's going on? That's exactly what we want to find out now, after we've heard from senior experts assessing the situation 
after we heard the public sharing their vision of a healthy ocean with us, we now come to the solution part and get an idea of what's already being done to make the ocean healthy and resilient. And again, we will have, first of all, four impulse talks, and that's followed by a discussion. And I would like to start by introducing you to Kenneth, or Ken Paul, who is a member of the, and Ken, I apologize if I completely mispronounce this, and I hope uh, you understand and you can correct me if it's wrong. He's a member of the Volastoki First Nation and the community of Nekotuk, ne Nekotuk. And he's, he smiles, okay, so that's okay. But as I said, you can correct me straight away. The important thing is that uh, this is a traditional territory which is located on the North Atlantic coast spanning the Canada-US border between Maine, New Brunswick, and Quebec. Uh, more important even is that Ken's worked regionally, nationally, internationally on all aspects relating to fisheries, aquaculture, oceans, governance, and aquatic resources, because they relate to inherent and treaty rights, negotiations, legislation, and policy. Uh, Kenneth Paul, uh, so very good to have you with us, and uh, we very much look forward to your impulse now. Uh, Lewin, thank you. Uh, so I introduce myself under my traditional name and my language just to bear witness to the ancestors and acknowledge them. Um, we, um, we and our nation are trying to um, address ocean health on many different aspects. One of the first and most important aspects is governance. We are uh, founding nations in North America. We have federal recognition in Canada through the Constitution. And more importantly, we actually have treaties dating back to the 1700s, which have uh, existed and have been in force before the United States became a country, an independent country, and before Canada uh, entered into, into their own constitution. So we are trying to reestablish this nation to nation relationship, which also includes ocean and ocean resources. So as, as Canada is pushing forward in the international decade of ocean sciences for sustainable development, we want to make sure that all of these large concepts such as uh, marine spatial planning, ecosystem-based approaches, um, in, like cumulative effects approaches, all the resources that are being extracted in the ocean sector are not going to have negative impacts on what we are doing within our territory. We are a fishing nation, a fishing indigenous group. Um, we have migratory species such as American eel, Atlantic salmon, which come from oceans far away. And we know that if there's activity that happens out in the ocean sector, that it's gonna impact um, what happens when these um, our relatives in, in the ocean space come back to our territories. We of course cannot control what happens in the open sea, but what we can do is prepare the homelands for these migratory species, making sure that we have clean river systems, make sure that we have good spawning areas, making sure that any kind of offshore activities such as uh, oil and gas exploration, uh, transportation of uh, tankers and things like that are not going to have negative impacts on these species. We of course are also concerned about the ocean species of which our ancestors and all the way up to today that have relied upon like, uh, Tuna, for example, Atlantic tuna. Uh, we're concerned about what's the health of our um, of our whales that are out in our in our waters too, because these are all part of our ecosystem, and we believe that these fish that come back into our waters are kind of like the platelets that are running through our veins um, and our arteries. They carry messages back to us. The other important thing that I just would like to uh, acknowledge, and I know I don't have a lot of time to get into this, this concept of traditional knowledge. There is a push internationally and a recognition that traditional knowledge is something that should be collected, that should be used, and our elders and knowledge keepers also recognize this. They want to share this information out. There are problems with the, uh, the misuse and misinterpretation of Indigenous knowledge in the past, traditional knowledge. Um, there is no intellectual property rights protection for um, the knowledge from our elders, even though there's lots of people that benefited from it. Um, but the most important thing that I want people to realize about traditional knowledge, the term traditional knowledge did not come from our peoples. 
it was something that was developed within the science community to try to describe the information that we have. And um, when we use our indigenous knowledge, it's actually a knowledge system. It's not just information that you can just grasp and, and implement. There's a whole value system and a methodology that has to be understood so that this information could be used in context. We have elders in our region who have come up with this concept of two-eyed seeing, where they're acknowledging Western science and traditional indigenous knowledge systems as two things that should be used together in order to get the best possible science. So what we are trying to do essentially is empower our coastal indigenous communities to have more um, more of their, I guess, ideas and their methodologies as central to scientific research in the ocean sector so that we can help mitigate some of the problems we're having with climate change. Um, I'm advocating also for any of our nation states and any funding agencies to consider making funding directly available to Indigenous coastal communities so that, that they can lead the science and that they can develop their own partnerships with people of their choosing. Because traditionally what happens is that researchers get funding and then they go to the Native communities and they ask them, what do you know about this or that? That approach is still valid. But if we have coastal communities, then I think some of the solutions that come from our coastal communities will help mitigate some of the problems we have with ocean health. And that's all I'll say for now. Leeway. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ken, for sharing. Uh, I'm sure uh, this is going to be a very, very, very exciting and interesting discussion later on. And Ken, you will join the discussion. So please do stay tuned. Thank you for now. We move on now to Karen N. Evans. She's a principal research scientist and team leader with a Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization based in Hobart, Tasmania, where she leads and contributes to research focused on progressing scientific understanding and development developing options to improve marine resource management. Uh, Karen, we very much look forward to, to your impulse as well. A very warm welcome and over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if we can put up uh, the slides, please. Great, thank you. So um, our oceans are complex systems and they're influenced by both natural and human components. And we know that if we reduce stresses on species and communities in general, they respond. And this reduction in stresses provides space for species and communities to build resilience to any remaining stresses. And we've got a really good example um, that uh, has recently been announced uh, in Australia. Uh, the humpback whale has recovered to a point that it's almost at carrying capacity, so that's at its maximum population due to um, the stopping of harvesting of humpback whales. And that, uh, that species has now been taken off our threatened species list. Um, it is still protected in Australian waters under our legislation, um, but it is no longer considered as uh, threatened and now um, very much a recovered population. So we know that if we take away some stresses, um, then animals and species and communities do respond um, to to that taking away of, of stresses. And this is something that we're exploring in the COVID-19 biologging project, which has been endorsed under the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And what we're really looking at is how animals respond when you take away those stresses. And in this case, what we're specifically looking at is um, how animals have responded to the reduction in marine activities by humans as a result of COVID-19 lockdowns. So we have a really unique opportunity to look at when you take away shipping, when you take away fishing, when you take away all of those human activities, how do animals respond? And then how can we use that information to then better develop improved management systems? Next slide, please. We also know that regardless of action, um, on the reduction of greenhouse gases. Uh, next slide, please. 
um, we are locked into a level of ongoing change. So our management strategies also need to consider adaptation pathways that can support building and maintaining resilience. This means not only ensuring the management looks across the whole system, but the management is also adaptive and able to respond to continuing change within the system. We'll need management systems to evolve to incorporate new technologies, new knowledge and new approaches to support responding to a changing environment. So while the biologging project um, is looking at how animals respond to short-term reductions in stresses, my research agency, the CSIRO, is developing next generation approaches and tools that can be used to reduce stresses over the longer term and support adaptive management. And I'm just going to quickly give you three examples that highlight where people with a good idea can facilitate change and where students are the leaders in developing these approaches. Um, the slide's not up at the moment, but um, my first example is um, we've been working with um, um, a person called Sam Elsom, who started his career in fashion um, and came to CSIRO with an idea that he could farm seaweed to capture carbon, but perhaps also use it um, within agricultural um, settings as well. Um, and by partnering with CSIRO, Sam has developed what we call a future feed, um, which can be fed to livestock to reduce methane um, emissions and is now working on expanding the same process to other species of seaweed so others can take up the model that he has developed. The second example is one that has been led by one of our PhD students, Rachel Alderman, who identified that a reduction of bycatch under future climate predictions was not going to be enough to ensure the maintenance of a healthy population of shy owls. So she identified a suite of potential intervention options that could be implemented. And one of those key interventions that she identified um, that significantly improved chick survival was a reduction in disease vectors that could be done once a year by wildlife officers. And her work has demonstrated by taking on a more holistic approach to reducing stresses, um, you can substantially improve the outcomes for species. And the final example I'll give to you today summarises work from my PhD student, Jessie Bowen, who has been developing models for forecasting disease state in species to be, at, be better able to plan operations to maintain fish quality and reduce food wastage along supply chains. And by improving planning of operations and reducing food wastage, less resources are used in supplying food um, sources that can be sustainable into the future. And I'll leave it there and thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. And just to explain, we only had one slide available. So something got mixed up somewhere, uh, lost uh, uh, in space. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, we could follow your presentation anyway. Uh, and obviously, we look forward uh, to you joining the discussion that will follow soon. Our next speaker, first of all, is Jean Everett, uh, Director of Programs and Operations for the Blue Climate Initiative, a multi-year global program engaging uh, various stakeholders to accelerate ocean-related strategies that address the climate uh, crisis. Uh, so it's looking at solutions for people, ocean, uh, and the planet, and it's sponsored by Titya Roa Society. And uh, Jean, um, good to have you with us, with or without slides. We look forward uh, to your presentation now. Hello, very nice to meet you. Uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak about the Blue Climate Initiative. I did share some slides. I don't know if they can be put up, but uh, if not, I will start, I'll, I'll speak to it. So just, yeah, you can stay on this slide for now. Um, so basically just a quick, very brief background on what is uh, BCI. So the or origins are in um, on a very small atoll of French Polynesia called Tetiroa where um, quite a few years back, a research center was established and an NGO to steward the atoll and to host research, um, ocean research efforts, studying the natural and cultural history of the, of the island. And then two, three years back um, in, in, in discussions we've had there, um, we were advised, why aren't we doing this, not only this research, which was relevant um, globally, 
um, is to actually take this to a bigger, to more ambitious program and develop um, a program to accelerate ocean-based solutions to climate change, but globally, not just the work on the ground on the atoll, but actually take it to the next level. So this is how the Blue Climate Initiative was created. So it's a program of Techaroa. Um, and what we're um, we're trying to do is basically our goal is to accelerate ocean-related solutions um, to climate change. Um, we are a multi-stakeholder program that engages scientists, innovators, investors, communities, global leaders. Um, and you can you can skip to the next slide. Um, Basically, we're, we're bringing together both science and traditional knowledge um, to reimagine, catalyze, uh, scale ocean-related solutions through a variety of pathways. So our, 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 we have a triple objective of ocean, people, and planet, and benefiting all three uh, through a very diverse um, ways of action, whether it's around policy, uh, stimulating community-based work, research, uh, funding, attracting funding, uh, education and behavior change, which is represented in that arc on the, on the diagram. And now more concretely, if you can switch to the next slide, I just want to go a bit more concretely to what, what have we done? Because this, this is very ambitious, very broad, very diverse. So to be more specific, the first step that we did a couple years ago um, was really more of a knowledge kind of based development to spark and share knowledge and ideas. So we drew on a group of 60 scientists to produce a publication that's on the upper left side of my slide that's available on our website, that's downloadable for free. And we asked these scientists from, from top research centers and universities around the world, what would they recommend? What would be their advice on how, what, what are the best solutions that protect as well as leverage the ocean to fight climate change? And we came up with, they, they produced um, a list of 40 solutions and now this is serving us as a guide for us and for our network and, and kind of a, a compass, if you want, as to what we could be, what one could be doing. So now after that, we started acting on those opportunities through our network and doers. And a second and next step that we did, and speaking a little directly to uh, Ken's presentation earlier, um, our first wave of action was to, to really incentivize um, work on the ground by, by offering prizes and competitions for communities as well as for 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 profit um, enterprises, which is the Ocean Innovation Prize. So our community award, which took place last year, funded work um, in all the, in very different uh, parts of the world, um, working around uh, seaweed farms in Tanzania, a coral reef in Palau, um, basically encouraging and supporting the work that communities are doing in protecting their environment, their natural world event, and also deriving livelihood from that ocean environment. Um, the other thing on the Ocean Innovation Prize, which came in later and was awarded last month, actually, the winners of the, the prize, also attracted a lot of interest from for-profit companies um, who were proposing technical, innovative solutions, again, that leverage the oceans for, for fight to fight climate change and protect the ocean at the same time. The winners of this, of this prize are, it ended up being all focused on seaweed solutions, um, which echo some of the, the discussions that came before us the, in terms of seaweed-based solutions for bioplastics, energy, um, as well as, well as uh, animal feed for livestock. And then finally, our last action um, is a Blue Climate Summit, which is really the next step. So how do we now accelerate these solutions? We sparked action, but now we want to scale it up. And we're holding a summit next year, next month actually a couple months from now in May, held in the, in the French Polynesia, where um, we are going to use this as a collaborative project-focused approach uh, to protect the ocean, advance ocean-based solutions by bringing together, again, investors, knowledge, knowledge developers, uh, traditional communities, you know, the local communities, uh, influencers and, and policymakers um, to accelerate the solution and bring people together in a room to network and, and expand this effort. And I'll leave it to that. I can. I would love to speak a little bit more about some of the examples of the project accelerated, but I'll leave that to our, our conversation later on. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. And uh, no worries. I'm sure you will have uh, ample opportunity during the discussion to elaborate uh, because we have one more uh, speaker coming up, Lillian Ann Krug. She's a scientific coordinator for the Partnership for Observation of the Global Ocean and coordinator of the NF. P-O-G-O-O, -O, POGO Alumni Network for the Ocean. Lillian has a special interest in the application of satellite imagery for coastal and ocean studies, and she's uh, dedicated to researching 
capacity development in observational ocean oceanography. She's Brazilian by birth, currently living and working in Portugal, and I assume that is also where she is joining us from right now. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Lillian, good to have you with us, and we're all ears. Thank you very much, Monica. Yes, uh, hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here uh, representing our alumni network, uh, as uh, well put it, the NF Pogo Alumni Network for the Ocean, or NANO, is a global network of former and present scholars of trainings provided by the partnership between the Japanese nonprofit organization, Nippon Foundation, and international group of oceanographic institutions represented by the Partnership for Observation of the Global Ocean, or Pogo. NANO was launched in 2010, with the purpose of expanding the benefits of the training after its conclusion and to provide further professional development opportunities and networking for these members. Uh, networking among the members and mentors are done via meetings and online communications. Uh, we keep website and social media activity where we post uh, news of interest, not only to members, but to early career ocean professionals everywhere. And we publish newsletters where members share their stories and experience and can practice scientific writing and editorial work. Through POGO advocacy activities, NANO members are also invited to take part in scientific and high-level events, such as the United Nations Climate Change Conference, where they can immerse in stakeholders' discussions and even interact with environmental ministers. But the NANO also have outreach and joint research projects uh, with the support of our uh, sponsor organizations, NF and FOGO. We provide small funding so our members can conduct local outreach activities with school children, small communities, or enthusiasts of the sea. And in the past, our members run five regional research projects that involve nearly 100 early career researchers uh, at these regions and promoted coastal monitoring research to relevant societal issues, such as harmful algal blooms, coastal erosions, or invasive species. Currently, we also have a global project where our members work together in keeping a network of 31 stations in 18 developing countries, monitoring essential oceanic variables that will support the understanding of levels of productivity, ocean acidification, and deoxygenation at these sites. The NANO members also use these fieldwork activities to promote ocean literacy and citizen science by taking students and community representatives with them to the field to learn how to collect oceanic information. Speaking in citizen science, we also have another project called SAGITA, where we are developing a low cost but scientifically reliable temperature sensor. The idea is to popularize temperature collection among the public with um, this non-expensive and easy to use oceanographic equipment. Anyone with a Sagita sensor and a smartphone application will be able to make temperature profiles at the sea or in a pier and contribute to the understanding of the coastal environment everywhere. Through this project, NANO is collaborating in improving frequency and coverage of data collection through the world's coastal zones, particularly in areas where resources and personnel are insufficient. We hope that with time, institutions and local governments will recognize their value and take the lead on secure support for a sustained long-term long -term observing system, which should include monitoring but also capacity development. The activities engaged in NANO help our members to solidify what they learned during the trainings, but also to build their expertise in other important aspects of a professional career in ocean science. Enhanced soft skills such as scientific writing, project management, science communication, and teamwork, and build their professional networks. There are some of, these are some of the requirements of a scientist's career that are usually built in experience. This kind of support is significantly less frequent than desired uh, for early career ocean scientists, particularly in developing countries. So we are proud to be part of the efforts of leveling the distribution of global ocean science capacity. Through supporting the future senior researchers and leaders, we are making the next generation of stakeholders better prepared to the challenges ahead and to be part of the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian. And this uh, 
basically leads us straight into the discussion round, the last one that we have for, for this core event. And I've seen uh, Tim and Karen making notes, getting all ready. And of course, anyone out there, if you have questions right now, is a good time to submit them in the chat so we can pass them on. Tim, Karen. Yeah, um, I was absolutely fascinated by the um, whole concept of lever leveraging what I would call deep knowledge, right? From um, traditional sources um, over centuries, much longer um, than we, well, we might just perceive. And uh, Ken, actually, I, I'm addressing this question maybe to you mainly. Um, one of the things that I find really fascinating about this is, and I would like to hear your opinion on it, is that there are very few nations actually out there which, who do this. Um, we have endless amounts of information. Um, say, for example, even on, uh, in Europe, um, from all sorts of sources like uh, pteroglyphs, etc., on the way it might have been. And it's impossible to leverage this information, and it's very, very difficult to get this funded, as you rightly pointed out, um, in, a, in a sort of a, yeah, I would say, uh, successful manner. So could you maybe advise the rest of the world um, on how we should be doing this. For example, Australia might benefit from that, um, and many other uh, African nations might actually benefit from this, because it, it doesn't seem to be an easy thing to do. Is it just because you are so clever to have treaties, um, and you actually, <laughs> actually, and therefore, um, yeah, it, it might make it a little easier, or, or do you have uh, yeah, thoughts on that? Treaties do um, make it a little bit easier, for sure, as you have documentation that recognizes nations. And in Canada, we are fortunate in a sense that we have constitutional recognition that these treaties exist and that we are recognized as nations and our rights exist. But <clears throat> in the work that I've done, like internationally with Indigenous communities, mostly in Canada, mind you, but I have been to some other communities in different parts of the world, the most important thing that I found is establishing the relationship, taking time to bend with the community and getting sort of that um, understanding, that trust. A lot of people don't put a lot of value into the relationship part of it. They think that, well, this is business, let's just go in and let's just do the work. But with Indigenous peoples that I know, there's this sort of sensory kind of um, whether whether they're assessing your spirit or whether they're trying to uh, assess other things, your emotions, your body language, they'll they'll be able to gauge your sincerity. And if you're able to build up that trust, and if the communities, um, the knowledge keepers, the elders are able to uh, feel that their needs are going to be met as well, that's when you start getting to like the good stuff. And um, another thing to keep in mind is that. With Indigenous peoples, even though we have our own economies, even though we rely on resources to um, help uh, with our clothing, our housing, our transportation, and all these other things that we take for granted in our Western society, um, most of the time when Indigenous peoples are in charge of their own resources and their own um, ways of doing things, the economic benefits is not paramount. What's most important is the longevity of the resources to make sure that there's plants for the future generations, make sure there's medicines for the future generations, make sure there's food for the future generations. Whereas what I find in Western society, when, it's, when science is sponsored by the state, we're trying to find maximum exploitation rates of resource extraction. And when, when a lot of states are doing that and they aren't talking to each other, that's when we have like things like overfishing or uh, mining in areas that are sensitive habitats for migratory bird species or things like that. So the relationship part of it is, is important. Um, there's also a spirituality aspect of it as well, but a lot, I think that's a little bit hard for a lot of people to grasp. But if you could do nothing else, plan to spend time with the community and try to listen to what their points of views are. Um, when they have problems, they will explain that. And they want to, our communities want to find out um, solutions to some of the questions they have as well. They just don't have the funding support to initiate their studies. Wow, yeah, really, really interesting. 
Um, yeah, would you like to ask your question next to Jean? Okay. Um, Jean, I guess it's a similar, um, a similar thing which you are going at, uh, really, but you are going at it from more the scientist side rather than um, in, in the sense that you're linking scientists to. Uh, it's, it's the other side. So could you share maybe some of something there which might actually help um, us engage better from the scientist side? Um, and, and some of your experiences there. It seems similar, but maybe it's a little bit more from that side. Yes, if I can, I can elaborate on that. Um, I feel like we, we position ourselves really at the crossroads of the work of communities. And uh, are, there's an echo. I don't know if this is a problem. No. Are you hearing an echo? Okay. Um, so the, the crossroads of the work of communities and the work of um, scientists. And so some of the projects that we are accelerating through our summit are focused on where the, the, the theme really of one of, one of the 16 of our summit is healthy blue communities. And um, there's kind of four principles uh, in the work that we are trying to reinforce and, and support in, the, in these projects. And I'll, I'll take an example, let's try an example of work that's being done in Palau um, and along the parallel of work being done in French Polynesia as well. So there's this four principles. One is honoring the interrelationship between communities and, uh, and the ocean. Um, so the work there is uh, echoing some of the statements that were done at the beginning of today's session um, and really recognize communities as stewards of the ocean and also dependent on the ocean for resources. Um, and, the, and then the second point is the vertical integration between what communities do and what science do. But to answer your question, uh, for example, there's a partnership in Palau between a community of fishermen that are naming themselves and considering themselves the Ocean Guardians is the name of, the, of this program. And they're working closely with the Scripps Institute, um, the U University of California, San Diego, doing research on and monitoring of coral reef. So the, the scientists from the research institute are working in partnership with the communities uh, using cameras and reef monitoring tools in order to drive down back to the communities and to reinforce you know, the traditional knowledge that communities have or equip them with additional scientific knowledge for them to better understand their resources and, uh, and continue to steward and, and, and then expand and reinforce the stewardship that they're doing locally on the ground. A similar project, kind of a twin project, I should say, a parallel project is being done in French Polynesia uh, around the concept of Rahui, uh, a traditional way of, of, of local communities and cultures of looking after their resources and living off of their, of their natural resources. So that's really that second kind of pillar of our approach is that vertical integration between communities and, and science. So um, I, and, then, and then another aspect that's really interesting for us is then the peer-to-peer -peer learning and exchanges between those communities, kind of a horizontal integration between these different programs. Um, and now, you know, the work that, that Ken is doing, it's, it's, it's very interesting to us um, because it really echoes those, the, the same challenges, the resource, this lack of, or the need for resources that these communities have and, and the collaboration of opportunities between science and, and, and the local work and the traditional knowledge there. So basically what we're saying here is that we need the real custodians of the areas that we're working in um, to be empowered to leverage what they know into our rather superficial societies as a whole. Um, and at the same time, um, being in, all of us being empowered to use uh, this knowledge and these observations, I would say, uh, in such a way that we actually all, um, yeah, yeah, help the ocean, or I suppose everybody gets something out of it in the long run. Um, and there, this is one view coming from the citizens who are actually in the know, as you may say, for no matter how long, and, and those on the other side who maybe just have other tools um, uh, as scientists are. And I guess that would bring us to the next point, Tim, with the other two candidates? Yeah, it's um, interesting to see that there's so much done, and it's good that we arrive at, at least to some extent, at the solution part, and we know there's a lot of things done already for a long time to some extent, um, but what I also see is that we're still coming from two ends, um, not really concerted action. There's either the environmentalist that is just starting something and or the science doing something and um, maybe we have to bring this more together. 
Lillian, what you, you said, this um, uh, Pogo network, I think it's, it's doing a lot of good things that are really very important. Um, but is it already approaching society or is, is there another large and important step to do further? Um, <clears throat> yes, I think that uh, the, the way that our members, which are early career scientists, uh, are approaching society, it's through outreach activities, bringing the information back, but also uh, on bringing the, the, what they learn during their training to their colleagues in their home countries. So what we call it cascade training. And um, I think that w one thing that uh, I, I see from this conversation uh, here and in the past sessions is that what, one important element for us uh, young scientists, for our young scientists, is to learn how to communicate with uh, non-scientists, with the general population, but also how to work together with traditional communities, respecting uh, what they bring and make sure that they receive back uh, what they need as well. Okay. Thank you. That's, uh, well, an interesting point, or at least some addition to that. But um, if I got you right, Karen, uh, your approach is also purely science-driven, and, and you're having a fantastic opportunity now with this COVID pandemic. I mean, one of, I think, more or less the only positive <laughs> effect of this uh, pandemic is that you can, can get a better understanding of how yeah, animals would respond only to natural variation, not to any human signals. I mean, which is a very important also because these days in, in the so-called Anthropocene, when we try to figure out what are natural controls, what are responses to any kind of human activities, it's very difficult. Now you get a, some kind of baseline. That is very important for the science and, and something that has to be transported. But uh, again, and this will help to find solutions, but does it go beyond science itself? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so I think two things to think about. Um, we, we currently have a situation um, where, as you said, there's lots of confounding elements um, when we study um, an animals. Um, so a lot of effort is put into understanding what is natural variability and then what is variability that's driven by human activities in the ocean. Um, and this particular project is really looking at how we can separate the human activities from natural responses. Mm -hmm. And if we understand how animals are naturally responding to the environment, then we can actually use that information to inform conservation management, um, to understand that if we pull this management lever, animals will respond in this way. And that's something unique that we haven't been able to, to really understand um, because humans have been using the ocean system for millennia, really. Um, so it does provide a unique opportunity to kind of go beyond um, just the science itself and really get down to how animals respond to their natural environment um, and how we can then use that information um, to better manage the environment and, and provide a space that animals can then um, build resilience within um, and, and we can um, support having those healthy environments. Um, one of the things that I will say, um, though, is that um, some of the other work that um, my organisation is doing is partnering with Indigenous communities um, in Australia and building um, an understanding <clears throat> from both sides um, on how Indigenous communities can use Western science um, to better manage their resources, but also how Western science um, can work with Indigenous um, to empower them to, um, 
to manage their resources um, effectively, sustainably, um, and ensure that they have that connection with their resources. Um, in Australia, um, Indigenous communities call it sea country, um, to ensure that we um, continue to support that con connection with sea country into the future in sustainable ways that benefit those communities. Yeah, that's a great point. It's very commendable, all these activities. But I think it again underlines what, what I said before. There's efforts here and there. And what I'm lacking to some extent is, is really a concept behind it. And I think that's an, a question that science has to raise for itself. Um, because we are all asked to do something. And there are many of us who have this environmentalist heart who are doing it. And um, But quite often, we are lacking the resources and the competence to do so. Um, we are asked to do it in our spare time, and we do it in our spare time in a way. And the problem is also that we, in the science system, there are no incentives for this kind of work. So it always depends on the individual. And I'm myself lucky to be in a position that I have got from our Ministry for Education and Research a project funded with resources for establishing a science society interface in a particular project and which is running very well because we have these resources, we have the competence to do so and we are reaching out to all stakeholder groups um, that we have uh, in that particular project. And I imagine if we would have this institutionalized, um, which is not the case so far, yeah, then we could have Uh, make much more progress in this context and would not rely on these individual activities on that scientists are working there with indigenous people um, that um, people are training other scientists or, or youngsters in their particular project all this is fantastic uh, but to reach this goal of a healthy ocean I think we need more concerted action concepts and, and I think that's also something that science and behind that the decision makers behind science also have to acknowledge this and provide concepts. What do you think as, as people, as organizations working at this interface um, which is very obvious from what you uh, were telling us? I, I agree with it, and I see a lot of effort coming along, at least on um, uh, specific points. I see a lot of activity here in Portugal with schools uh, for an ocean literacy program in, in, in the school um, uh, cu curriculum. And I see also in several universities or funding agencies requiring uh, science Uh, a science communication component on projects, on proposals. Uh, what I think it's necessary, it's a more uh, strong effort from everyone. I mean, from every major agency or university co going towards this goal as well. If I can jump in also, I've got something to add. Um, I wanted to refer to a very interesting model, a citizens assembly model. Um, that has been piloted in France, and now uh, there's a project, one of the community awards that we funded is doing that on the island of Morea in French Polynesia. And the effort there is to basically really incorporate and, and implement a process where the community, the, the, the citizens, uh, completely democratic, uh, really a distributed representation of the citizens, so almost randomly selected group of citizens, is involved in, the, in advising and the decision-making processes of local government. But along with that process, so it's a democratic process, what is added on to this is an advisory board of scientists. So it's almost embedded, the, the interaction between the communities and citizens and the science is embedded and, and formally you know, officialized into those processes, into the local governance processes. And this is, This is a project that's trying to, you know, that's already happening in Morea. Um, it's it needs more, and it's, it's it's under development. I can't say that it's already 100% successful, but that's basically the the ideal scenario um, that we're trying to develop there. And so this advisory board and the scientists and there's there's scientists from from research centers on the island of Morea that are now supporting the, the the communities and working together with the communities and interacting, both bringing in traditional knowledge, local knowledge, historical knowledge, as well as scientific knowledge in making recommendations to the local government in their investment processes. And the, gov the local government has an impetus to, 
to listen to the to, to these advice, both the communities and the and the science in because they have a general strategy and a general they've they've made some general commitments to sustainable development on the island. So there's a there's a demand, there's an appetite from the local governments to work with these uh, these science groups and communities and, and and hear their joint advice and their joint recommendation. So that's that's kind of the model that's been that's being attempted right now in Moria. Can I just give you an example from Germany? Germany, believe it or not, has one of the longest dike systems in the world to prevent sea level rise or to deal with sea level rise. And when the concept was originally thought out, it was thought through. It was thought through by engineers um, all along one of the largest biosphere reservoir reservoirs in the world, mm -hmm. the Wadden Sea. And we, we, the nature conservists and, and the people who were responsible for the biosphere reserve and all the people who lived in it were absolutely unhappy with the way they were being treated. Um, and these are people who live on tiny little um, islands um, which, who are extremely, which are extremely susceptible to sea level rise. And it was one of the most interesting processes whereby engineers who had walked along a route of, we don't need to talk to them, we just need to know how to build dikes, then went out into the community talked to the um, Nature Conservancy uh, people, talked to the whole Wadden Sea um, guideline, guidelines groups, and actually came up a con with a joint concept on how to save the Wadden Sea from erosion together, um, based on a whole system of, uh, yeah, very large scale dikes and groins and engineering works. Um, and I do think that it's not that far away that we need to have to, we are going to have to do this in the, on the long run everywhere um, when it comes to the ocean, because after all, it, we need all of our expertise, um, and not just scientists, but yeah, engineers, yeah, the people from the governments, plus also the citizens um, in those areas to leverage um, what we need to do. Um, so there are many examples in the world, I think, which we could pull out of the book and maybe say, look, this is how it, how it could go. This is, you know, an example of where it actually worked, that communities were involved. And with that, I'd like to just throw that back uh, maybe to you to give us examples from your regions where it was re something really changed, was really successful um, when it came to, to, your, to providing a more healthy environment and a healthy ocean in your regions based on this concept of leveraging citizen knowledge. Oh, everybody's thinking. <laughs> um, so I'll give an example from Australia. Uh, we have uh, in Australia what are um, formally called uh, national resource management groups. Um, and they're similar to what Gian was, um, was describing um, in Moria. Uh, where you have community groups that are paired with scientists and those community groups are really custodians of the coastal area in which uh, these groups operate. And they operate right around Australia. So there's many of these groups. They're formally funded um, through uh, the Australian government. Um, they're probably underfunded, um, <laughs> most definitely, um, as most groups are, um, but it really connects local communities that are custodians of their coastal communities um, with scientists um, to really um, develop ways in which they can better manage their, their coastal um, regions, um, but also how they can connect them with local government and inform local government on their decision making around um, that coastal community. Um, so that's just one example from Australia. It's it's not um, a, a massive change um, that has occurred, as your dike example ha um, is, but it's it's something that's set up to ensure that there is community input into government decision making around um, coastal environments and marine environments. Ken, do you have examples? Well, there's places in our region, and I will admit that our nation, uh, which works primarily in uh, Willowstoke, which is the St. John River watershed, we are not being engaged like we should. But our sister nation, the Mi'kmaq, which is 
directly to our east, they have had more uh, positive relationships with scientists. They're basically, they had to build a partnership with the other non-native communities in the area, uh, the provincial governments, federal governments, and the uh, municipalities. And they've developed it in such a way where that the, the First Nations here, the individuals here, are actually the scientific lead. This huge area called the Bedora Lakes, which is an inland sea. And when they work on any kind of science initiative, because they're looking at things such as uh, renewable energy, uh, traditional fishing practices, um, development of uh, municipalities and roadways, first thing that they will do is they'll bring their elders together. And they'll have tea, they'll have lunch, they'll have people explain what, what's going on with the initiatives. And the elders, in their own way, in their own language, will talk about some of the things that should be prioritized. That information becomes the basis, and then they'll bring it out to the larger groups with representatives from these other communities. So they're trying to build back the ecosystem, and it's a, they're lucky in, in that it's a contained um, inland sea. There's a, like a defined boundary on that. Um, so we are trying to adopt that model ourselves. We are about 10 years behind, I would say, you know, but we are getting there. And um, like, unfortunately, we have to deal with the, the larger governance aspects of it, which you're dealing with Canada, all the way down to the individuals that are going to go out and do like the, the sampling, the fishing, uh, looking for areas where there's... Uh, sweetgrass and fiddleheads and some of these other traditional um, plants in our region. We have uh, GIS mapping capabilities as well. This is why I think it's important to call uh, traditional knowledge a knowledge system because it indicates that it's a way of knowing, there's a methodology, but it also kind of gives you permission to use modern technol technology and tools to actually integrate that stuff in with us. Um, with respect to like uh, just the comment before about um, whether these things should be institutionalized, I get a little bit nervous when that happens because that disempowers the local communities. Mm. And I find that our Western approach is like we try to find an answer to something to apply across the globe. That, that we come up with a scientific truth. It's a truth for everywhere it's until another scientist comes along and just proves it. But um, what I'm really hoping is going to happen is that we empower coastal communities, we empower our Indigenous nations, that all of this patchwork of uh, solutions is going to basically kind of, like I envision it's just kind of a quilt, that all of these solutions together will help broaden the planet because Indigenous knowledge in the way that it's uh, developed, it's local knowledge. It can't be universally transferred past the area. The language doesn't make sense. The uh, local communities don't like the species and stuff like that. It doesn't make sense to transfer that information, but the methodology may be similar. So that's sort of how I'm, we're trying to deal. We're trying to do our part in our region anyway to help uh, contribute to the global solution. Thank you. Yeah, it's very good to have all these examples. But there's another challenge. It's late, but people are still active in the chat. And I think there's an important question that goes out to all of us, not only to science, but also to society. In recent times, there has been an erosion of trust in science. We've seen this with widespread mistrust of experts in climate change or in public health. COVID. At the, same at the same time, voices of local indigenous communities have long been ignored, marginalized, and suppressed. It seems to be a plague of ignorance. How to counteract this plague? I think that's a serious issue that does not only concern science, but also all other stakeholders. What do you think? You can just say, yes, sir, it is a plague, <laughs> and it's bad news. Oh. Yeah. Well, I think that if there was more engagement with individuals and more engagement with communities, that there less distrust of uh, science. Because the science, a lot of times, is done in our institutions, like uh, universities and colleges, um, and government labs and things like that. And people don't understand what the purpose of a lot of these studies are. It, it comes down to the relationships. So science is still, still too much in the ivory tower, maybe? No, I think we need the media, yeah. and I think we need the media to help us. I was just, I was just trying 
to, to sneak in here, <laughs> uh, Ken and everybody else, uh, because I think that that uh, question that was just raised in the chat uh, is, is uh, I just called it uh, from the sidelines, a philosophical question. And of course, it all falls uh, together with fake news and, and all of that that we have right now and conspiracy theories. And uh, we've seen a massive rise of that uh, in, in recent years, and it is quite worrying. And we already also see the fruit of that kind of movement, which is, which is not nice, and it's actually quite scary. Uh, but because you're all scientists, you all, uh, you know, work with facts, with, with data, with evidence, uh, what is it that you would need? What kind of support do you need and from whom to make your voice heard? Because it is important that you're being heard, uh, else all those wonderful stories that I'm privileged enough to, to listen to now, because I'm the moderator of this event, but so many people out there don't know those wonderful stories, be it the dyke that uh, Karen just mentioned, uh, any of those uh, wonderful stories, they don't get out. Um, what kind of support do you need and who do you think can give you the support that science can actually be heard and hopefully believed? Yeah, I agree with Karen on the role of media on this. I believe that there are um, environmental journalists or someone who can make the bridge between translating our uh, our data and information into some more palatable uh, and, and more attractive way to, to translate the message um, to the public. I feel the weight on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I can add on to, I'm, I'm coming back to the example of the work being done in, in Palau by our one of our awardees, Juan Reef. Um, I think bringing the science down to the ground of the communities and, and so that the, sign, the information that they're producing is useful to the communities. And then they're co-producing. They're not even producing, they're co-producing because they're working with the communities and gathering data and they're choosing what data is useful to the communities by deciding together. So it's not just the science working on their on silo and the communities on the other. They're working together to identify what is what is useful to the to the, the local you know users and stewards of the resources in terms of information, and involving the communities in the generation of that of that knowledge and the production of that knowledge. Um, and then another point, and in, in the way in the approach, so it's this is really hearing the voice and embedding. And turning that science information, you know, or shaping it, allowing it to shape, take shape to, to a, a form that is useful to the users, to the communities, to the private sector, possibly to whoever on the ground. I also think another point is making sure that the power of the communities is respected and honored. And it's not it's not the science coming, scientists coming and lecturing the communities, but it's more the science co-producing information and then letting the communities decide and the local stakeholders decide or local government for that matter. It's not an, an, a lecture, or, but it's more here are the options, here, here, here are some facts. And then it's your decision how what you want to do, whether you want to steward, you know, now that you know the risks and, and the impacts of different actions on different environments and ecosystems, you choose what is viable to you, depending on what your community needs in the short term and in the long run. So the, 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 the solutions the management solutions of, the, of nature are still, and the, and the decision, the ownership of the decisions are still made by the communities, but it's done in a way that they have access information to information that's useful to them, hmm. because it's been, they've been involved in the co-design of that information, the co-production of that information. I actually have a, a question for Karen, uh, but you're uh, all welcome to join in because, Karen, when you said earlier, when you brought this uh, example up with the dike and you said there's so many more, you know, we can pull them out of the book. And I was sitting there and I thought, yeah, is there actually such a thing, a reference book or a reference platform? I mean, an event like this is great because it brings uh, you together. It brings the people together who, who follow it. But everybody else, uh, if, if you're confronted with an issue, uh, be it as a citizen or as a scientist or in any engineer, uh, how do you know what's already happened elsewhere that you can bring up in, in an argument and say, listen, this worked really well? Uh, is, is there such a platform, Karen? No, but I do think we need to go at it in a much more positive manner um, and, and take out the 
really good examples of where we have had successes and show that there are ways forward. And there are many successes that we could pull out of the hat, in my view, and we do not make the most of them. Um, and actually, I just wanted to say there are lots of other comments suddenly coming in, in in the chat. <laughs> Everybody's uh, waking up. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I think we might need to um, answer them online, actually, mm. just so you don't feel lost. And basically, what they're just saying is that there's transdisciplinary re approaches are really important, yeah. that we need to come up with simple measures, and I think we need to answer these questions online, if yeah. we may say so. And you, el you elegantly just uh, included a, a comment that we had in the chat. Yeah. Uh, you brought that in as well. Um, again, I'm the one who is... Uh, the bearer of bad news because time is up. Uh, but thank you to all the panelists, all the speakers uh, of this session just now. Thank you so much for con your contribution. Uh, and because this brings us to the end of the first part of this first or fourth, fourth uh, UN Ocean Decade Laboratory, A Healthy and Resilient Ocean. Uh, before, however, we come to the real end of this core event, because obviously we have the satellite activities coming up and we have the wrap up in two days from now. But before we come to the end of the core event, uh, Karen and Tim, uh, you've been working very hard over the last four hours. Did you have a chance to actually listen in order to share some of the key takeaways with us now? Wow, that's difficult to say something, but there's such a lot of information. But of course, um, I, I, what is quite clear is um, we need to communicate more. There must be more communication, more collaboration between science and society. Uh, we know there's a lot of problems, um, but we've seen that people have, have very different views, visions of a healthy ocean, and people are doing something. We just recently had these activities, where, but we also heard the young generation, they are well informed, at least some of them. So we have to spread the word better. We have to bring forward these solutions, and we need more events like this for example, to bring people together and to discuss these issues and spread the word. Scientists cannot go it alone, is what I would say. Came out of this whole discussion today. And we, we really can't. We need to involve everyone and because we are all custodians of this blue planet. Um, and that means everyone has to start to stand up and act. And we can only advise as best we can. That's well, what came out. That, that came out. And as I mentioned already, it's not over yet. No. Actually, for a lot of you out there, the work is only just beginning with, for example, the satellite activities. But at this point, the work is only beginning. I want to remind you before we give, say, our farewell for now, uh, if you want to support the Ocean Decade, if you want to assist the Decade Coordination and the IOC UNESCO Secretariat with strategic, technical and review process, uh, then please uh, do check out how to uh, sign on as an expert, as an expert for the expert roster, uh, something that has newly been newly established and they're looking for you. So do check this out. Uh, and of course, I would like to invite you now uh, to join the satellite activities over the next 48 hours. You don't have to do them all. You can't do them all. You need some sleep in between as well. Uh, but there are 29 satellite activities uh, and you can even continue to network because the networking tables, the matchmaking, uh, ocean library, everything that is uh, uh, interactive on our website, the platform remains open. So um, if, if you feel like continuing to chat, you can do so. They're, they're wide awake. Yeah. They're wide awake <laughs> and ready to go. And for example, you can start right away by joining one of the three parallel networking tables that are starting as soon as we finish here. Uh, and I can briefly share with you what those uh, networking tables are. You remember, you find them or you can join them via those three arrows at the bottom uh, of the left column on your website. Uh, the first one, uh, the topic, what is a health and resilient ocean, what will you contribute to a healthy ocean, uh, head, uh, led by uh, Renate Ducat and Claudia Schulz from the Forschungszentrum Jülich Project Management Office. Then we have the topic, is plastic in the ocean really the issue? What else is the issue? Uh, that will be chaired by Angelika Dumamuzzi, a science manager at Walfried Wegener Institute Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research. And uh, last but not least, the topic, what is your vision on a healthy ocean? 
session. That will be chaired by Isa Manlosa, a social scientist, postdoctoral researcher at Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research. So there's plenty to do, plenty to talk about. Uh, and whatever you do over the next 48 hours, actually less now, uh, be sure to be back. Friday, 4 p.m. Central European time. Karen, Tim and I will be waiting for you in order to share with you what's been happening over the last uh, 36 hours, actually. Now I'm rather stopping. <laughs> Calculation isn't my 40. Uh, but certainly for the laboratory wrap-up. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the work and uh, all the lessons learned. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Bye bye. 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 <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, yeah.